Are you doing comics anymore? Or are yeah. you? Okay. Yeah, actually, I am doing a series with Kelly Sue DeConnick called Parisian White. It's a creator owned series. You know, it's interesting that we're talking about this stuff with theater and painted stuff and comics and the whole vernacular. And one of the things that, that I'm finding out is that, and I don't, I don't know if you've gone through this as well, I'm having a hell of a time deciding on how I want to approach it or how it wants to dictate itself to me. Because it's like I, I want to do something that's painted, but yet I think that cartooning is still like everybody talks about how all art aspires to music i think all art aspires to cartooning to be honest i mean it sounds like a, a kind of a silly thing but the idea of saying that the ultimate truth through the lie that to me is the essence of cartooning is to find the absolute truth of something through the simplicity of it define cartooning for me by your terms and standards but before you do let me call my wife okay <laughs> I called her. I called before I got started. I fucked up. I told her I wouldn't. If I think I, I take the shit. So bear with me just a so, moment. Sure. Well, I'm just going to continue. You know, and uh, if anybody falls off, I'll just I'll just hit. You know, falls asleep, I'll just hit. Howard. What I'm aware of is that everything I'm going through right now, in terms of trying to figure out how to approach it, I keep thinking that I used to understand what I was doing. It's like all of those answers were completely just right there to be clean without any kind of effort whatsoever. And I realized that. Everything I've worked on has been difficult and a slog and fighting through. I find that yeah. shocking. Yeah. I really do. Because I watched you work. And one of the reasons that I'm very envious of your work, I'm envious of a lot of things. But most people's work did not make me jealous. Bill's work makes me jealous. And I watched him work. And I watched your facility flow. Maybe you're berserk inside. But it doesn't show in any way. I'm serious. Remember that thing that Fred Carabaugh wrote about? You're all out of person and the illusion is fun today. Okay, okay, yes. I mean, I am the illusion of fun today. My sloppiness and roughness comes out of constantly polishing. And I've watched you explode. You know, I've been there. I mean, I watch you work. Okay? And I find it hard to believe <clears throat> that you struggle as much as you say you do. It's a constant struggle. It's, I literally feel like I am I'm making a mistake, correcting, making a mistake, correcting. It's a difference between working in acrylic and working in watercolor. What are? Okay, okay. Do you use acrylic as a watercolor? Do you literally use watercolor? I use watercolor. I, 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 I jump into I jump <laughs> yes. every medium I possibly can. Partly because, to me, acrylic is fixing and making mistakes and fixing. Watercolor is checks. It's thinking ahead. So why bother playing with a medium that creates challenges that could be solved by using another medium to play its part? Masochism. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my work is done. <laughs> it's, it's like wanting to know how to use a medium. You know, it's interesting that we've talked about the love of theater. I was actually involved with a woman for about 15 years who was one of the co-creators of a show called Godspell. It actually helped me become much more aware of theater. And we're talking here tonight about process. And that's at least what it feels like that we're sort of getting into right now. And as if anybody else out here who's an artist or a writer, it's like you may have people that you find that were influences to you or for you, other people who sort of paved the way, and other people who sort of became influences in the sense of I'm going to try to do it in this way and not that way. It's like by the choices we make of our influences, it's almost like it's already innately within us by virtue of our choices of what we're, we're drawn to. It's almost like it's sort of the old paradigm of why is it that a masochist will find a sadist in a city of a million people? What we choose as influences are almost things that are innately already inherently part of who we are. It's like I can look at a certain style of work and I'm not going to do these characters assassination yet. And it will actually not register, or it will register in the sense of, I'll, I'll look at people's work that is technically fucking brilliant, and yet antiseptic to me, and it holds no interest to in me whatsoever. Whereas I will see something that feels right, is technically, artistically, academically wrong, but it feels honest and true, and I will be like, that. That's what I want. Is there Dave Johnson here? Okay, Dave's on here. Yeah, yeah. Sure yeah, right, yeah. Right. yeah. The reason I mention this specifically because uh, Dave turned me on to, to Dan Panosian stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, I only knew Dan as what he was. Okay, and I thought, why? I mean, I looked at him. He freaked the shit. It was fantastic. And I said before I had a chance to stop myself, as we occasionally blurt, I won't name the name that I use. Yeah. I said, he's that guy 
Only interesting. <laughs> right. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Maybe I'll tell some of you later. <laughs> and that's exactly right. I collect illustration, as you know. And my collection reflects both my own specific interest in taste, but also stuff that has nothing to do with what I do. And Hearst is a perfect example of that. Beckhoff is an entirely other idea. But I like to look at stuff that has nothing to do with what I do or think. Because it makes me think about stuff that I should be thinking about beyond what I care about. I assume that that's what you're talking about as well. To a degree, it's when you mention Beckhoff, I mean, talk about originals, I mean. <laughs> well, I, I have those, but I also have more Beckhoff paintings. Yeah, is it Harry? Harry Beckhoff. Harry Beckhoff. For those of you, again, looking it up, he was, I suppose he could be considered like a microbiologist. I mean, the way he drew. An eccentric guy yeah. who worked from the late 20s to the early 70s mm -hmm. without any change in style. His work was uh, flat color and line done with a very delicate hand. He was a mailman who decided to try his hand at illustration in the late 20s. And the only thing that changed was the hair science. The drawing was consistent and constant. And what made him so eccentric was his original pencil drawings were the size of playing cards. This big, that I'm not being in any way facetious. And the drawing in these things is so exquisite as to be beyond belief. It frequently is better in that original little pencil drawing that isn't finished. He's an astonishing draftsman. He was also a mascot and a beloved figure of his fellow illustrators. He's very close friends with James Montgomery Flagg and uh, Dean Cornwall. He modeled for a number of Cornwall's pieces. And at a roast, Flagg did a caricature of him using a microscope to use a Balopticon to look at one of his drawings. <laughs> and, um, and he's an astonishing talent. I have a back off of a draft board, a group of people sitting listening to a speech over the toilet in my middle floor bathroom. So I watch it every time I urinate. I go where the walls are, you know. <laughs> and every time I look at this piece, I find something new. It's a, there's just an attitude. It's that piece of all people listening, mm -hmm. there's a guy standing yeah, on the yeah. stairs on all days. And it's just filled with acting. And Bill and I, I think the one thing we share beyond any other interest is acting. Because we work in a business that has been trammeled over the past, say, 25 or 30 years by a diminishing sense of sale, coupled with a circling of the wagons to do the same thing that got the sale to diminish in the first place in a lot of ways. And both of us are guys who do characters who act. Going yeah. back to the theater set. And the guys whose work I like in comic books are the guys who do characters that are engaging with me. Some years back, I was on a panel with two guys, very nice guys, you know, they both had those, those huge hips through beards that were so popular over the years back. They were very young, they had hats that were on backwards and shit, and one was wearing a pork pile. They, they were like the Billy Gillis and Manergy Krebs at their time. And they were talking about a book they got. And it sounded really interesting, I won't say it the book. And I bought the trade, five issues in the trade. And it was all brown, I just got all the characters, none, none of the characters looked at each other. There was no physical body language of any kind. And five issues, there wasn't a single subjective image of any kind in any page. Not once in any of the characters you gave with me as the reader. And that's something I know for a fact that he does constantly, and I do as well. Because I believe that one of the, one of the things we, we forget about in comics is you are in collusion with us. It is a shared experience. You are the engine of the page. Okay? You're responsible for moving the story along. We're responsible for giving you enough of a story to make you give a shit enough about moving that story along. And so much of that, in my opinion, is a subjective relationship with the reader. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's into when you were saying that about getting back to what you said about theater. I remember having a conversation with Stan Drake. Stan Drake, who was a phenomenal illustrator for romance strips called Heart of Julia Jones in the 60s and 70s, eventually went on to do Blondie. Which makes no sense <laughs> whatsoever. Well, as, he, as he said, well, that was again make a living. because <clears throat> the romance stuff had dried up. Right. But he, and, he, and he wouldn't have gone to work for Marvel. He was it. actually, he was doing inking for Marvel. Mm -hmm. He was doing it. But there was more money in the Blondie stuff because of the connection with Dean yeah. Young and Raymond. Uh, Raymond's son. son. Jim, 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 Jim. Yeah, Jim Ray. Now, was he fast on that? Oh, he was very fast. <clears> yeah. On that stuff, on, the, on the Blondie yeah. stuff? Well, eventually he became much faster. When he first started out, he actually had clip files right. of just nothing but the images. And then he would like box. And he said, he goes, I'm not a cartoonist. He goes, I'm an illustrator drawing in the style of cartoons. That's what he took on the assignment. That was my reaction. Right. But only the digression. Yeah, no, and he would, he would say that. But one of the things that he also said was that Pugh also brought up theater. He said that comics, in terms of acting, he said what was really important for comics is he said that he really sort of despised the Mary Worth 
style of stuff where all the characters are sort of looking off to the corners of the panels <laughs> and sort of interacting. And Stan felt that it was not over there. It was over there. It was a grand gesture. So, and again, Neil sort of came in after Stan and sort of did everything with the hands and, and all that. So I'm getting a cup of coffee, you know. But, uh, <laughs> no, but, but, but I, think, I think that's a really valid point. Stan really is a pivot in that sense. There's a guy who teaches up at Stanford, he's film studies, named Scott Cattman, who I've known since he was a kid. He lived around the corner from me and Simon's when we were living in Brooklyn. And he had never really heard of Drake's work. He didn't he was aware of it. And I wrote an introduction when Charlie Pelto's uh, paperback trade, trade paperbacks of the material. And he was flabbergasted by his relationship with what he was teaching in film science. That selling of the idea. And that Drake, I mean, I don't know anything about Drake other than the Alex Raymond stuff and some other things that Dennis stole. But for a fact, the work represents in these three panel daily strips a level of emotional depth that is almost absent from most comic books today. Well, I, if, if you don't mind, I can actually tell you how we look at, the same thing with Bernie Fuchs as an illustrator, the sort of captured moment, as opposed to something <clears throat> being set up as a plateau and this sort of freeze. Stan came by that, all of that incredibly honestly. Stan was, as a younger guy, he was actually a really good looking guy. He wanted to be- I know, I his, see the right, yeah, yeah. And his father was also, I think, a radio guy. Stan, one of his friends, or a bunch of his friends got together and basically took Stan's name and entered him into a audition contest for Phil. Stan went out to LA and he said that he smoked like, he goes, I went through three packs of cigarettes doing this scene with this woman. He ended up getting selected to do a, a series that was going to be sort of a, a competition series for not the Joe Gillis stuff, but Mickey Rooney, you know, the whole Mickey Rooney stuff. Oh, no, Andy Hardy? Andy Hardy type okay. stuff. As like a younger than the Hunts Hall stuff that eventually became, going, but he was actually going to be an actor on film. And what happened? What happened was he was all set to go. We signed the contract. The next day was December 7th, right. 1941. Stan went to the military. He became, Vietnam. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so when Stan got out, he wanted to look for all of his film and it was, it was all pretty much destroyed. And it was actually Jackie Gleason and uh, who, Art, Carney. Art, Art Carney, who was a friend of his, said, look, at any given time, there's only 15% of any actor working. He said, you're a gifted drafter. You should get into, like... See, you know, what, what, what surprises me is that, he, that, you know, he didn't become a comic book man because his stuff has everything that's called for in a comic book line. I wrote an introduction for the Leather Gleason and Charlie Byron crime stuff. You know, you, crime does not pay. The truly drecky comics, okay, they're really awful. <laughs> and when you look at that stuff, you realize two things. One, it's the work of assistants. It's very much very clear the work of guys working for other guys. And two, in all likelihood, one out of three of those guys was working as a mainstream journeyman illustrator within 10 years of doing that. If you go to almost every illustrator you know of a certain generation, it's at least one, two, or three comic book jobs back in the day. And it's always that way, okay? <laughs> I've always wondered why those guys, you know, like, like Koskowski went from comic books to the strips. And it was just great. But Drake, Drake seemed to me like a natural. And I thought, and Gil Kane once was snippily, that's what he did, he was always right, snippy, yeah. snippily dismissed Neil Adams as, as making comic books safe for commercial life. A really a pseudo observation, but, you know, hey, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. He's right. And fuck it. We're digressing now. Do you have a question? I did have a question. Was it a good one? Yeah. Stand up and share it with us. All right. A couple of things. No, no, just so one. When, when you talk about Robert Fawcett, he's one of those guys, yeah. you know, that whole generation that was in like... 1940s and 50s, yes. Yeah, in Westport, you know, who did the famous artist book right, and all right. that stuff. What we're not talking about, and we really, really need to pay attention to, opportunities weren't available to everyone. Were or were not? Were not. When we talk about comic books, we know specifically, as a Jew, that a lot of Jews could not work in mainstream, yes, <laughs> as a Brooklyn person, just like you, just this is what we're baby. talking about. Yeah. So it's really important that we talk about that, that comic books were another venture that the Waspy and other people, but to quote Robert Gordon, there's a line in, in Hey Kids Comics where one of the characters says, isn't that what comics are? Jews fucking over Jews? <laughs> and uh, I stand by that. And when I came into the business, very aggressive to this, he peeled the <laughs> No, no, it's okay. I'm just taking in what he said, what you're saying, and also thinking 
I'm Polish. I'm Polish. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the only Polish guy around in the general was Bob Powell. I had no idea. Oh yeah, Bob Bud Budlowski. And, 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 and no, no. <laughs> was it? Blasky. And he was a raving, Jew baiting anti Semite. Hated Eisner's guts. Sorry, guys. You know, because we killed Christ. I read about it in the paper. We did. Um, or at least we just got the contract. You know? It's okay. But I think you raise a valid point. That illustration was in its time a waspy business. The exception is a guy like Saul Pepper, who's clearly a waspy. But comics were a place for Jews to work. It's really true. When I came into the business, all the old guys, with the exception of Murphy, who's this you know, honey boy southerner, were either Jews or Italians. I mean, I met Gil when I was 13, and he was just this tower, this fabulous figure, and Joe Hubert, and then Toth, who was also another Jew later, okay? When I went to work for Gil at the age of 18, I told this story last time I was here, and it's true. Gil was a guy who was like Casper Guppy. He was a man who liked talking to a man who liked to talk. And he was a very, very voluble guy. I am as well. And one day he said, we're not going to work for about an hour. Okay. And he said, here are the anti-Semites. <laughs> <laughs> no bullshit. Now bear in mind, these are the guys that he spent every Friday evening with having cocktails. Because he was in Westport. He was literally, you know, drinking babies up, you know. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm just, I had dinner with Gil, my ex-wife, and, and Bert Hogarth. Oh, that must have been one fucking ugly like, guy. I, I'm just... Uh, I'm just Real living moments here. Go ahead. Hogarth looked and sounded like a drawing he'd done of the Dean. <laughs> he was one of the most loathsome people I've ever met in my life. And anybody who could intimidate Gil Kane, and he really put Gil through his face. As raised by that night. I mean, half of my time spent with Gil in the last couple of years of his life was shed this stuff. You have outdone your influences. You have moved beyond your influences. And he never believed me. He died not knowing that. He died refusing to believe that. Which I find really repulsive and scary. It demonstrated the hold that they had on him. Because Gil was a perfect example of a monomaniac with no self-esteem, who hated himself deeply, who was just like filled with self-loathing. He gets this nose job in 1949. And the minute the nose job takes place, he, turns, he transforms from this shtetl boy, this, this extra infibular on the roof, into a Charles Saxon drawing of the New York. <laughs> who it turns out, by the way, did the same transformation. I always thought Saxon was a wasp. But Saxon was one of our people. A nice Jewish boy. Thank you, Charlie. You know. And as soon as that happened, all of that shtetl stuff, all that Yiddishkeit, lodged itself in his system to so profound a degree that he could take me, his first Jewish assistant, and give me the list of the anti-Semites. It wasn't until years later that I found out that, as I said, you know, all the guys, the Walkers, the Browns, all the guys that he drank, I went to cocktail parties with on Friday nights. Years later, I met the Palm with my second wife. And the Palm was a tradition for us because the Palm had been a cartoonist place where comics guys went to eat when they could afford it. And I'm walking down the stairs, I'm at Palm 2, and I'm walking down the stairs, and the bottom of the stairs is a drawing of Amy by Jack Tippett. And that was the first of the anti-Semites. And I literally had one of those sense memory moments of, like this. Just literally registered on me without intellectually registering, but like emotionally meaning, oh my God. And the fucked up upness of the relationships of the comic book business that preceded my generation of did. Because these guys started at 14. They were children. You can't know how long these lives spent hating themselves, hating each other. You can't know how much Carmen and Tantino Phil Payne hated each other with a passion from the time that they were 14. Until their deaths. I had to have Joe Orlando navigate for me the, the, the corridors of DC Comics because Carmen knew I knew Gil. Not a job. The venality, the pettiness. We all promised ourselves we would never sink to that level five years in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Westport was kind of a microcosm of all of that, too. Having dinner with Bill, I mean, and it's interesting because I remember reading his Adam comics, and it was like, and all of those fantastic images of looking up the nose of all of these characters. I hate people to point that trope out. No. Leave the man alone. No, but, no, no. But, I, but what I felt was, is that that's how I felt like that's how he viewed Everybody. He did talk to my boy. Well, but I'll tell you where that came from if you want. What I'm aware of is that what you were just saying about, I guess, the, the trauma, for lack of a better word, I can still recall how Gil and Byrne were at each other. And anytime, and Byrne was actually doing everything he could to not only destroy Gil, but also me. He was actually he was right. putting moves on my wife. At the I remember time. this. I remember this. <laughs> oh, no, no. This guy's. We were 
in our 20s, he was like, what, 70s? He was dead for three years, that's what we told Okay, that's right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but, but to see, I was a super teen, like a super hip, but I, I was able to catch these micro expressions on Gil's face of almost like, he was sort of getting punched a bit. But, and it was really kind of, because to me, both of these guys, more so Gil, because I knew Gil's work much better. Well, and also, you know, let's face it, Hogan was a fraud. Oh yeah, I bought those friggin' if you come on. Yeah, I bought those dynamic anatomy. They're like trees die for that. <laughs> 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 you know? But it was interesting to see how he was just doing everything he could to even if he was making a really good point, it was like Hogarth would have none of it. It was almost like there was an attack mode that he was on because he was making it all about him. At one point he was talking to me about art history, and he mentioned Fauvism, and I had no idea what Fauvism was. And he looked at me, and he was like, basically, he's like, can you believe he doesn't know who Fauvism is? And he sees hugging my wife and just like coming at me. And I was like, at one moment, Gil and I just sort of looked at each other. He goes, he's like, I'm your on, you're on, you're on. <laughs> you cannot know the competition for the pile that existed from work. I don't know what it was like for guys for you. You were the guy of your generation, whether you know it or not. When you came in, Frank was inept and crude, but he had energy and rage, which is what I had, okay? But you had skills already. What it was like for me, when I came in, to have Bernie Rison waiting for me in the room. This is a tragedy, because there is no way you can compete with Bernie Rison. <laughs> Understand this, this is the truth. I mean, Rison was like, again, he worked hard, and his work got better and better as he ate, but he immersed from the brow of Zeus. His work was astonishing. I mean, come on, you see this work, and he was a clock, I and mean, he was kind of a dumbass. But, you know, he, he was like a turkey on the ring, he was looking up, waiting. No. And, but, but the work was, was staggering. I mean, it was just fucking brilliant. And you couldn't compete. So you had to find some other way around. You had, to, you had to do a workaround to get to where you wanted to be. And I believe that to a certain extent, you've made people feel the same way about your people, your crew. Because you came in five years after me. Between me and you, Starlin comes in. And Starlin is the first guy, other than Rich Buckler, was available to what Stan needs, okay? And I cannot convey how much my generation believe, maybe it was just bullshit to each other, but we all believe the second volume of A Kids Comics is about EC and its impact on my generation 20 years after the fact. And that impact comes from those Valentine paperbacks that were hanging in the newsstands and then drugstores in the era of the 60s. All of us in my generation, the exception of Simonson, had come to comics because of those books. They had an enormous impact and the fact that you come along and are able to satisfy Marvel's needs, because DC was functionally irrelevant. DC was a company that followed what Marvel was doing at that point. Marvel really owned the game at that time. And I have to think that guys coming along after you were intimidated by the fact that you clearly do pretty much whatever you wanted to do. You may say it was hard for you to do it, but we both know that once it gets on paper, the difficulty vanishes, and the papers were man. You had to look at your stuff. I never understood, I do now, but I never at that time understood why the comic audience preferred John Byrne's work to your work. And I do now. I understand why now. But this is the same reason why life is talk to Pat. No, I'm serious. I'm gonna, I've heard this. this uh, if you're going in this direction, I think you are. Forgive me for jumping in. There is a perception among fans who want to get into into the business, that they find a talent who sort of sets the low bar. Yeah. Who's the three you want to kill? Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> no, I, I, that's fair. You yeah. Know? yeah. But I think that's to a certain extent the way it is. But I don't think there were fans out there who wanted to be you. That saddens me. It really does. But that they did or did not. Yeah. One of the things I've come to realize, Clark Diamond died this week. Clark Diamond was a guy who was an old EC fan, he's probably a five years my senior. He was a guy who, in his writing, I had one of those epiphanies that, like, why didn't I see this before? that the Comics Code Authority didn't just infantilize the comic book business, it also infantilized the audience. It also created an audience, it drove away an audience who would be interested in material that was pushed a little bit further, and left behind people who, in his words, would be happy with a pat on the head and a no prize. And it's functionally true. I said this in print, and one of Burns' acolytes became very upset with me, that if anybody had told me that the most popular artist of the 1980s would be someone who was as cypherous, I mean, John's work is incredibly proficient technically, but utterly uninteresting. There, it's interesting we're sort of talking about all of these different styles and everything else and different people, because 
there is kind of a through line to all of this, at least in, in, the, way, in the way I'm interpreting it. One thing I just want to say about Bernie, it's like part of the issue is working on something, the pain of loving something too much or the curse of thinking about something too much. I think Bernie thought about what he thought about and only that. I don't think Bernie, like when you, you said that he might have been a cluck or whatever, it's like I don't think he necessarily was. I just think he didn't delve as deep into other arenas as, as certainly like – I will, like, not only navel gaze, I'll climb up my own ass and turn myself inside out to avoid being one of those people who is absolutely sure that I'm right. I would rather presume a level of ignorance. That's the Catholic opinion. It's true. It's that constant questioning of moral value. That's really where it comes from, mm -hmm. to a great extent. It has to do with certainty, because people who are absolutely certain are, to me, some of the most dangerous people on the planet. <laughs> I mean, I live in a constant state. I mean, I'm a Jewish guy who was raised by Catholics. It's right. not a joke. But I spent the first three and a half years of my life in a Catholic family. Because I'm illegitimate. I'm a bastard literally in favor of them. And um, <laughs> I was planted in, in, in a Catholic family, the patriarch of which was the by housekeeper near Carter. They were German Catholics who changed their name from some incredibly horrible German World War I name to, to Westgate, so they became English all of a sudden. And they raised me, and I was deeply steeped in Catholicism until my mother found out they were converting me. And she pulled me out when she married a guy I thought was my father. And so I'm enraptured. If ever the day came that I ever was actually struck by a belief in God, it's likely that I would find myself as a Catholic, despite all the bullshit. Because there is the, the mystery, the physical beauty of the Mass, everything about it. It's sad with me. I can still bring up that sense of memory of the I smell of incense. And when I read Camille Paglia about the statues of the saints, I got it. The lubriciousness of those statues, the sexiness of it, there's something so phenomenally attractive about shame in lieu of guilt. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Come on. Guilt is for, shame is of. Okay? I'm completely obsessed with it. I really am. I love it. I mean, at least one of my wives is. Um, <laughs> I think that you know, struck me from the very first moment I met you was even though you were very facile with your words, you weren't glib though. It was like there was a level of intellect and a constant striving about reason in everything that you seem to do. I mean, your method comes from guilt. But your methodology. <laughs> I mean, it. I mean, it. It's very, very simple. It comes but, from guilt. Your methodology. I mean, I remember there were a couple of times I think when I worked trying to assist you, and I think probably making things probably ultimately made many times more worse and making more worse for you. Making um, me look bad. No, the way you would approach things, because one of our biggest, you know, interesting conversations, or not even necessarily areas of disagreement, was your claiming to me that I lack structure. And I still stand by okay. it. Okay. <laughs> no. But it's no longer the case. Well, but it's what led me to create the character of Harvard Chalky and Stray Toasters. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who is all about structure. And he didn't but, think I knew. <laughs> but, I'm sure people are going to tell. But the point is, is that the fact that you... <coughs> challenged me on that. It's like, as much as we had our moments of sort of back and forth, nobody made me think as much as you did about stuff. And the reason for that, that obsession with structure is based on absolute insect fear. It really is. It's, it's the lizard fear. Because for me, I cannot imagine working the way Elmer Leonard did without an album. Right. Uh, yeah. I just can't. I mean, I love Leonard's work. Certainly one of my five favorite crime writers. Absolutely. But Every so often, his stuff just, you know, get ready to run over by a truck. And I feel that way about Alan, for example, Alan Moore. I was told he had to read the Swamp Sing saga. And I'm reading it, it's fantastic. And then it just sort of melts, goes away. But talk about structure, I've worked with Alan. So I actually... So it's sweat labor in reading. Have you ever read one of Alan Moore's scripts? I mean, literally, they're like phone books. Literally, yeah. they're like phone books. And every sentence ends with, and of course, if you have a better way of doing this, please be mine. Which is sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> sort of like the saying, look, if you want to play football, you know, knock yourself out. I mean, it was the kind of thing where I would work with him on it and I would just read through everything and he would give background characters, stories and everything else. And I thought, how am I going to plus this in any kind of a way? Like call him up and say, I gave a character a beard. Or no. <laughs> it's like the point was I'm either going to draw this or I'm going to put a bullet in my head. How many pages did you do? Forget issues. How many pages did you do? Big numbers. Yeah. I, well, I think I did 32 pages with him in Brought to Light, which was a whole other thing. And then I did three issues of 48 pages. I, at this point, it's like it's it's lost to, you know, mm -hmm. it's right. time. Yeah, it's all a blur. 
I literally painted myself into a corner with that. The point of that is, is that I had 45 different models that I was working from, and I set my, up the, a standard for myself. I'm going to go in, I'm going to paint, air, if I'm going to do things out of focus, I'm going to airbrush focus, so I'm going to try to capture everything in the panel by hand. It's like, I'm going to airbrush stuff out of, like I said, out of focus. I'm going to tighten things up. I'm going to make sure everything is legitimate. i got 45 different characters I'm working with. I've got to hire models for stuff. And there was some scenes where there are little kids making Molotov cocktails. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, and Westport being very waspy, it's like at the time I had long hair and blonde hair, and I'm driving around and I'm asking parents if I can actually take photos of the little kids. And I, had to, I actually had to pretend that they were like making lemonade as opposed to Molotov coffee. Now, would you agree that in retrospect you wish you'd call the name of Steve Park as a black and white and simple cartoon? Absolutely. Yeah, it's the like, Jeffrey saga? You yeah, know? Yeah, so well, that's the thing that's striking me more and more now. The more I'm doing, and it's, I'm ashamed in some respects that I have to keep relearning Lessons that I thought I'd already learned. What kind of easy is that? We yeah. all did. One of the reasons you're still working, one of the reasons I'm still working, is that we are at least willing to admit that an annual reinvention is a requirement of the maintenance of the career. One of the reasons why there's only one other person in my generation who's doing work that it is not, not a parody of itself is the fact that those guys become subsumed with satisfaction at the work they're doing, and they reach a certain plateau, and they begin to repeat themselves. And I'm too terrified to repeat myself. So I gotta find something else to do. I believe you're in the same boat. Yeah. You bore easily, so do I. Do you bore easily on the same day? Or no, do you no, 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 no. I have a work ethic that is enviable. How long does it take for it to run its course? I don't work in terms of time anymore. Okay. I don't work against time, I work against mission. My work life is very organized. I live in a small town. I look like a hobo most of the time. And it's true. I only clean up to be seen in public because all these fucking selfies and shit. <laughs> and I, I have breakfast with Peter on, on a, a regular basis, and I, and I generally come in looking like a homeless guy who stole you. Suddenly, I don't feel so bad. No, no, no. I, I, both the one I, woman around the wear is a very effective way of spending right, my time. Right. My door is always open. My Sunday night consists of knowing what I'm going to be doing on Friday next. I organize my time card. I really have it all laid out. I know what I'm doing. If I finish at 3, I'm done. I watch television the rest of the afternoon. If I finish at 7, my wife feeds me. When I was teaching at Marvel, I did a, a six year series of seminars at Marvel. And the first day of that was always about time management because comic books, you know what I'm talking about, attracts hobbyists. All of us are guys who, who drew comics on our mother's cutting board on the dining room table, everybody else is a slave. That's just it. Anybody who tells me they hate the comics as a second choice is a lying sack of shit. <laughs> comics has more to comment with the Jesuits than anything else. It is a call. <laughs> it's the old uh, Arthur Miller, it shows you. You know, the golden age of comics is 12 because that's really when it's imprinted on you. You know what's going on. You are owned by it. It takes your ass and see it just sells your soul. And the difference between the generation of the seed of mine and my generation and Bill's is that we went in with no expectations. And I say this with complete, you know, with no fear of contradiction. But this was it. It was the BBO on the generation that preceded us, I believe, went in thinking this was a way station, leading to something else more important. And every one of those guys died terrified to find out that the work that they held in contempt for 40, 50 years was the work of their lives. Mm -hmm. And what separates us from that is that we went in with eyes open, that it was the work itself. I'll never forget, I'm at Marvel years ago, this is really certain. I mean, Mike Esposito. I mean, all of us, I mean, I was a big fan of Ross Andrew. Okay. Because right? I had been schooled on Ross Andrew. Everybody hates Ross Andrew because of Mike Esposito. Because he named them badly and he really fucked them up. Esposito's passes are breathtaking. The sense of depth, the sense of scale, the sense of volume. You can't have John Jose Garcia Lopez without Ross Andrew. He's not as pretty as J.G. As Young, know, but the volume, the shape and form. And I use the word fan in the company of Esposito and the contempt, the utter drip of disdain with which he greeted this was staggering to me. It was very revealing to me. Those guys had such contempt for their audience, for their readers. It just ran deep and profound, except for a couple of guys, Gil being one of them. Gil really identified who's willing to listen to the audience. These guys just really were separated from that and woke up one morning and realized that nothing else was coming down the pipe. When you were talking about burn, 
Again, he lived in the one town over from me in, in Connecticut. Well, he's like the Susan Cain of Connecticut, though, right? He lives in his house. Yeah, except that he's now living in the remnants of the glass globe, you know? Everything <laughs> <laughs> like, is shattered around him. Because actually, I remember when he, when he was married. My experience with John can be summed up in this little anecdote. Is that I remember going to <coughs> Mark Grunewald, his, his memorial service, <coughs> and I very rarely saw John at all. And John, I was actually with... Mark's widow, and we were walking, we saw John, and John was standing on a stairwell overlooking everybody who was there for the memorial. And I walked over with her, and I'm blanking on her name right now, forgive me. Um, Mrs. Room. Yeah, Mrs. Room. <laughs> yeah, <Mrs. laughs> <laughs> I said, it's good to see you. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances. He just stopped and he said, well, you know me, Bill, nothing can keep me down. And then she turned and walked away. And then on the way home, because he actually gave me and my girlfriend a ride back, he proceeded to tell me that he wasn't like me. He goes, I'm not an innovator. He goes, I don't want to try something new. He goes, I'm a fixer. I take what's wrong with comics, which has been done before, and I fix it. And I thought, it's like he just told me everything about himself right there. And I'm not saying that to Milan. No, 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 no but, but that, that, is, that is fantastic because it goes directly without naming names to the single movement right now, this essay, which addresses the fact that we work in the business of universal pastiche. That is a variation on the theme business. There's all variations on themes. And that when you get down to it at its core, the paradigm in comic books is Chuck Jones' Rotor and Haley. It's all about an endless, unfinished chase in which characters are corporately owned and never actually achieve closure in their world. And John is the architect. That's fantastic. <laughs> the, the piano, you know, that, that will fall eventually. Drawn like Kyle Baker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kyle Baker, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just to go back to what you were saying earlier about Gil and about him going to his grave not knowing, still being <clears throat> tortured in some respects? Yeah, okay, so. How much of that, and whether it's, I don't know, whether it's Catholic guilt or Jewish guilt or whatever. It's Catholic, Catholic shame. Catholic, Jewish Jewish, okay. <laughs> Separate issue. Well, um, <laughs> how much of that do you feel fits the paradigm of somebody who gets into comics of that level of what causes comics to choose us? I mean, what is it that you believe in our DNA? I found comics for me. I discovered comics when I was four years old. Two cousins, eight and 12, respectively, had outgrown them, and they'd given me their comics. And in those days, this is 1955, you read all kinds, I read it. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and I was imprinted on it immediately. It was imprinted on me immediately, and instinctually I knew, at four rather, that someone made these things. That these were not just organic objects that had occurred. And I wanted to be that. And I had no talent, no skills in it. I never did, but I had hunger and black <laughs> There's a lot to be said for this, trust me. You can't underestimate great. Um, Gil was very much the same. Gil was the guy who started experimenting Jack Kirby. And it isn't until he finds himself in the relationship with Homer of developing that flayed face. You know, going from, from the Mac Ray Boy, Kevin Marlon <coughs> Jr. figure, the Lou Fine figure, to getting this plates of muscle, those body things. And when he does that, he begins to develop a point of view. His problem, and I believe this is true, is that the great unifying factor of all the men who mentored me is none of them could write work a ship. Bill couldn't write. Gray couldn't write. Woody certainly couldn't write. The one who's still alive can't write. I want him to name. And because of that, they were trapped in the cycle of servicing other people's work. And when they tried to write, their rage came through in the text. And in Gil's case, he was a smart guy. He was an autodidact. In 10th grade education, let, let school become a comic book. And he could not get back what it was that common thread that maintained. When I met him, I worked with him on Black and White, which was just awful. I realized that he no longer read the material that he was doing. He wasn't as conscious of what he was competing with as he should have been. And my feeling is, if you're going to compete with him, know the fuck what you're competing with. If you're going to write a Western, read the best Western you've ever read and try to destroy it. That line about, you know, you don't want to play tennis by reading a book about playing tennis. You want to play tennis by playing somebody who can beat you. And that's, that's what it's yeah. about. Yeah. Okay? And by the time he was doing this stuff, he lost any real interest. And he wasn't entertained by it. But he couldn't even analyze it. Excellent and separate from being entertained by the material. He couldn't even analyze the stuff to understand it. To get value of it. I don't think he could bring himself 
to read the material analytically. In general, I mean, not just simply of the medium, but to be thinking. I mean, because one of the things that I, that I find is that people who really do have longevity, in a real true sense, are the people who are always questioning or always analyzing. Yes, not in the material itself. Oh, look, look, you remember a couple of years back, you may not even be aware of it, there's a real kerfuffle going on in the comic book business about using photographs for reference. What do these people think? <laughs> if you can do it, you can do it. See how it works out for you. you know? Or light box. My yeah. true screws and see how far you get. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, on, like, okay? And we all use photographs. Because basically, we are in the business of capturing a version of reality. And I tried to teach you how you use those. It was one of the most frustrating experiences of my life. I introduced him to Don Cameron, who was in awe of him. And just the frustration was huge because he never learned how to slow down. He was what Eisner thought Kirby was. It was a six page a day guy. Interesting, okay. okay. And he couldn't stop. He couldn't go beyond the generic city, the generic car, the generic suit. And you and I both know that <clears throat> what sets us apart from guys like John is that there's a specificity to the choices you make. That that woman is wearing a specific kind of shoes. It's like the word cipher is thrown around a lot, but it's like, you know, there's the cipher for an eye. You can do a Charles Schultz cipher for an eye. Basically, it's that. Whereas you take, like, say, a Neil Adams or a Stan Drake, if they just make it up without looking at photo reference because of all the years that they have used photo reference, it's still a cipher. It's very different to look at your eye as opposed to your eye as opposed to your eye. My eye. You have a mirror on your desk, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everybody works with a mirror on their desk. I just posted a Times Square piece on Facebook. And Larry Hammond says, well, you guys look like your expression. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very, very active face. <laughs> I mean, I may not be pretty. There's stuff going on here that creates it. I got a mug, you know? And you use your mug. That's what you do. You learn occasionally by accident, but you'll learn nonetheless. The fact that he didn't introspect in that way, that's a really good point. Like, you need to be aware of what is out there. But how do you feel about the fact of some people who just sort of feel, I'm just going to do my own thing, like a Zukowski or somebody like that. Like, again, he's not a comic book guy, but you know, look, I know. come on. There's a website devoted to the fans of Alex Stove. And drawing like Alex Stove is not being influenced by Alex Stove. I'm, drawing I'm, I'm more in love with him now than I ever It grows. Yeah. I mean, you look at this stuff and you say, I'm such an unbearable and suffering human being. I was, I was such a horrible person. And he really was. I mean, trust me. It, uh, just apocalyptically awful. You check and see how awful he was? He loved you, you, too. Awful he loved you too. Everybody. What's that? No, no. He was the worst. He dated my second wife. David Armstrong introduced me to Alex Dove in 1975. Hogarth talked about himself all the time. Alex did not talk about No, he talked shit about everybody else. I'm okay with that. Get a lot of good guys at that. There you go. Are you enjoying this or? We've <laughs> 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 been passing in about 15 years. We've passed each other in the room. We communicate on Facebook and we hate the same people. <laughs> it's a really good thing. I'm going to be working on it later on this evening to try to make him hate other people that I hate, but he hasn't heard of yet. <laughs> um, there are people in this room who saying exactly what I'm talking about. Sparrow, I'm looking at you. So, questions, thoughts, ideas, instincts. This guy was brave enough to stand up and offer a question about Jews. Good <laughs> <laughs> question. Hey, Jack. Hey. You mentioned briefly, like, uh, Gil's tendency of referring to everyone as my. Ah. Where did that Symphony go? Sid. Jumping with my boy Sid in the city. Jumping with my boy Sid in the city. He's the president of the DJ committee. Symphony Sid Cohen was the greatest jockey in New York City in the 40s and 50s. He was the guy who was Charlie Parker. Boy, boy, the guy wants to get white Christmas. Come on, what do you say? You know. And he ended his career after you know, scandalizing his company by becoming a Spanish language DJ without speaking any Spanish. <laughs> he, did, he literally worked phonetically for the last two years of his life. Soy su hermano, Symphony Sid, word. Swear to God. That's where Gil King got it from. Okay. That's where my boy came from. Also, the fact that he never met anybody's names because he was a complete soul. But true. But true. Scott, you got something? Yeah, I've got a question for Bill. When you first started at Marvel, did you have to like stay within the lines? Or was it like, <laughs> <laughs> like, free to be you? When you finally were able to break free to be you? Okay, well, the, again, the similarity here, I mean, I, I will answer this, but it's like, Comics Pikmin. I don't know how old you were when you basically 
said out loud, I'm going to do this for a living. Four. Okay, you were four. I was, I was seven. I told my father oh, yeah, when I was seven. I mean, I was like, this is my jam. When In I, those words? <laughs> no. <laughs> I love it when they have an aneurysm in a childhood story. <laughs> Dad, I'm doing this. It's like, here's another thing you can blame on me for your drinking, you know? <laughs> it's like, oh, 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 oh. Uh, Parents, that is good. I actually wanted to get into comics. Pretty much was following through on that goal ever since I was a kid. Didn't think I was good enough for Marvel. So I actually went in my second year of art school. All of my friends were older and they were graduating. And I sort of felt, well, let me just see if I can get a portfolio together for comic books for DC. And I remember seeing that, I'm blanking on his name, I'll just leave it at that, who was actually doing work in sort of very Neil Adams style at the time. And I thought- At DC or Marvel? At DC. And I thought, if he can get work, I know I can get work. Buckler, oh, right? No, Buckler was a moral. Grell. Oh, it was it was, it was, it was, it was, it was It was my girl. And again, I love my great guy, but it was like, I you thought- You can take him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so I basically thought it was like, you have to admit, if you're going to get into this business, it's like everybody thinks about comic books being sort of this superhero benign, sort of silly stuff for kids. It's fucking cutthroat. It's twat. It's what? It's twat. It really is. We are just, as I said, five years in, we all became exactly the better of shit guilt at our previous generation. You know, fuck you, no, fuck you, no. And to a great extent, I got my first major job, the factory job, because I aced another artist out of it. Another guy was assigned to the job. And I said, I can do a better job. I was lying, I couldn't. But the editor, Danny O'Neill, had doubts about the other guy's ability to deliver. I went home, he gave us a page rate, and said, go home and do samples. I came in, I spent literally 48 hours drawing the fuck out of this stuff. And he phoned it in. I got the job. Mm -hmm. And typically I was not available to bring quality to the job, so it was just, it was a terrible job that I did. I spent most of my life, every night, going to bed, apologizing to the guy I don't believe in for the first eight years of my career. Mm -hmm. That's how cutthroat things can be. Right. You know? Well, there is a level of competitiveness, and I, and I certainly felt that way when I would see other people who were getting jobs. That competitiveness all, actually... All Andy knows is money. What's that? All Andy knows is money. Yeah. <laughs> I want that guy's bucks. You know? I don't want that guy's bucks, because I oddly believe that there's enough to go around. I'm still a little bit of a, you wow. know, I'm, I'm still naive. You are yeah. the nicest person on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's saying a whole lot. No, 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 Michael's just patient. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, real quick, I actually put together a portfolio, and Neil Adams was the guy I grew up with, like, falling out. Was he the guy who was screwing one of the I wanted to have, uh, like, as much of a career as he had. I didn't necessarily want to steal it, because I didn't feel like, I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to think I could steal it. I just wanted entry. Even though I had fallen in love with illustration, fine art, Rauschenberg, illustrators like Bob Peake and Bernie Fuchs, it was like all of this other stuff that encompassed art, from film to you name it, to music, that was already starting to percolate in there. But I thought, if I'm going to try to do comic books, to me, comics, I'll, I'll just go back to the Neil Adams stuff. Even though there was a whole period of time when I was nuts about Sergio Aragonis, I would just like slavishly copy Sergio. I'd love to see that yeah. stuff. <laughs> well, if you look at a lot of like, new mutant stuff, oh, like, yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. with the mouths that go outside of the pores and face, it was like that abstract expressionism type stuff. But that, so, that was your heroin angle, wasn't it? Just <laughs> <laughs> comedy, kids, comedy. <laughs> My uh, alcohol days, I mean, that's the reason I pretty much stopped was the breaking of the drawing hand. So, yeah. That so, was really so, stupid. Yeah, I mean, it was, yeah. <laughs> but it was a wake up call. A well, wake up call. Yeah. You, you could have done it by doing it the other hand. What is this girl thing? If anything, it, it allowed me to have something to share with Barry Smith, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> that, there's such Catholic mystery in that. Yeah, story. exactly. It's like, you know. I want, I want to wrap myself in it for just No, a it, I'm digressing all over the place. Oh, come on, what are we doing here? Uh, Barry hated my inking over him. Oh, I remember this. It's just he tore me to shreds, and I couldn't disagree with him, but the conversation, it eventually came around to the fact that we both used to play guitar and both broke up our drawing hands. And somehow that didn't quite do away with all of the shit I put over his pencils, but it was like, it was this weird bonding thing. We're like feral cats. People who do comedy are feral cats and we'll look at anything to bond when we get the opportunity. Yeah. Of course, we don't, we end up talking shit about it later on. <laughs> There's no one, I can see your hand, your line working over less effective than Barry's. Barry has such a measured study. I am not a pre-Raphaelite. 
<laughs> you're basically a post-eight year poo guy, like, by the way. <laughs> I mean, Jesus, it doesn't mix. Right. I mean, we like, it was like Woody, we'd be like Woody Eaton Gill. Right. Woody Eaton Gill Rabbit. It contextually weird, right? Right. But, just to go back real quick, I decided I wasn't good enough for Marvel, so I went to DC with a whole bunch of pages of, like, the Batman, Green Lantern, Green Arrow stuff. Which school did you work at that? It was Coletta. The thing is, is that at the time I went, again, I lived three or four hours away in New Jersey. I bailed hay. I was a little Abner. I went in with, with everything I was wearing was petroleum based. I mean, there was nothing, there was no cotton. I had pants you could play chess on. You know, it was like we're checkers. Eiffel Tower tie. I remember this. Yeah, it was embarrassing. Actually, you look like you drew yourself. <laughs> The way that Tom Palmer looks like Jack Davis drew him. That's true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Come on. You know? I went in there. There were no such thing as today where you need to give a blood sample and you need to have somebody like scan in your passport to be able to like let you in to like visit the editors to just get in there. Because of course Marvel and DC are real targets of terrorism. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, that's at, at that point, I was just there. What finally got me in the door was that I watched the receptionist do nothing but eat all afternoon. <laughs> and I think I upset her so much, she was like, just staring at me. <laughs> and so I went in, Coletta actually said, I like your stuff. You'll be on the street in two weeks because of the implosion, whatever the right. that was. He said, I'm going to call Neil. So I went over to see Continuity, walked over with Tony Despoto. It was, somebody, it was one of his guys who was up at Neil, took me over to Marvel. So I basically got a job, a career at Marvel with a portfolio of nothing but DC superheroes. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I was really just hoping to get a critique or a pinup or like can come back in six months or don't bother. I figured if I don't get any response at all, I can go back and finish my final year of art school and I'll go into something else. And I literally walked out like my life had changed completely. It was one of those, you know, big deal things that happened, you know, on rare occasions, you know. It was pretty much of a shock for me, but it wasn't like I had planned it. I was too ignorant to be afraid. <laughs> but the time where you started and evolved, were there any editors holding you back from being you, or was there a point where you were allowed to just have free reign and just go off the rails and do the stuff that... I was pretty much, I was like the Trojan horse. I came in and would just wanting to do Neil stuff. And then, because I, like I said, I'd grown up on a farm and there were very few other kids who were into comics, none of whom knew Neil Adams. It was like, for some reason, Neil's work spoke to me. Even though when I first saw it, I despised it. It, was, it wasn't Kurt Swan, it wasn't comfort food. <laughs> yeah, right. Because it wasn't Kurt, it wasn't Murph. Right. So when I started to get a lot of critique, being a clone and everything else, all of a sudden I started to feel angry and invisible and this sense of everything I put my you know, commitment to was somehow being called into question. And I started to feel invisible. And anger again, you know, that sense of feeling invisible and feeling denied and feeling kind of cast aside, all of that has its place in terms of, of providing a great level of impetus <coughs> and a catalyst for you to change. Because I was putting stuff in my sketchbooks, like I was into fashion illustration, and I said, why can't we do stuff in comics where there's like, you just see these like these women who are like 15 tens tall, with just this <laughs> swath of just charcoal for her head, her hair, instead of all of this other sort of anal stuff in comics. I said, why can't we do a building that is not drawn with a ruler? Because not every building needs to be drawn with a ruler, because it's like that implies too much structure. <laughs> so, what were you talking about? I believe is the confluence of your arrival and Reigns being released. But Scott is getting that. Was there anybody trying to stop you from pushing material into a direction? And by the time you came in, you looked out. Had you come in when I was there with my generation, you would have been much more constrained. Because as much as Neil was respected by the time you came in, he was suspected much more so in that late 60s, early 70s. The guys in the golf is like this world, but fans hate it. What you did, like with Scars and Flowers, um, Flowers of Heaven. Yeah, right. What you were doing with that was such a major influence on me. You didn't make any money at all. But Arlen said, I stand by. Arlen, sure was he. No. <laughs> I, I know he's not here. Uh, I, I, I took him to task for one of the, he did one of the sporting himself things. 
And what it comes down to is what he said was, he denied this, what he said, but exactly what he said. He said, my function in comics in the 70s was to fail at doing graphic novels so that he could come along and do them successful. Hey, fuck you, guy. Basically, my work in the 70s was irrelevant. I mean, I, I, mean, I didn't come in I wasn't in the 80s. But I never felt that I had anywhere near to handle the technique that you did. You were just there. You know, I mean, I spent the first 10 years of my career denying the value of technique and the rest of it, doing everything I possibly could to learn to do stuff. And it just seemed to me that you were a guy to catch up to. People talk about David McKean. McKean's work has a beauty to it, but it lacks narrative value. Your work always has narrative value. That's really important. As I've gotten older, comics are about pictures of narrative value, that an image has meaning beyond its placement of character in space is the defining element of why the picture exists. And you've always done that. Even your most abstract stuff, it's always been that narrative value. When you were going through this, that Ronald Searle period, that's what I saw, and that's not our comments. Wordsmith-wise, I mean, I was totally also into Hunter Thompson. I don't share your enthusiasm. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, no, yeah. yeah, there were a lot of things that sort of went into the mix. When I finally decided that I was going to just either do what I was going to do, I love this medium. I feel like this medium can handle anything. It's not just cookie cutter stuff. It can handle fine art, it can handle abstraction, it can handle music, it can handle theater, it can handle all of it. And I'm either going to do that or I'm getting out because it was really like do it or get off the pot kind of a thing. And like you may feel that what you did maybe didn't make any money, but it certainly impacted me in the sense of like I wanted to come in and take what you had done and find my own way to make it work. And again, I think a lot of it does have to do with my <laughs> and certain things because people talk about commitment and everything else, but there is definitely an element of luck. Look, and if, you're, timing. if you're born in what, you're born in 60? 58. 58, yeah. okay. I think if you were born in 30, you would have been a player at the ladies' home drive. Yeah, okay, that, I can see that. <laughs> I do. I'm serious. Where we meet is the appreciation of a guy like Al Parker. Al Parker, is, in my opinion, the greatest American illustrator of the mid-20th century ever. He was extraordinary. And as a goof, a phrase I hate using, but as a goof, in March of 1954, Parker illustrated seven stories in an issue of Cosmopolitan in seven different styles using seven different pseudonyms. And it was an astonishing hat trick. The skill set you developed in comics would have been playable there. Well, I he was not going to be hiring you. You know, <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's funny how I noticed coming up to the 83, both of your works, you talk about narrative. Up here too. As crazy as your work ever got, I always knew what I was looking at. The same thing with you, Howard. I was never confused. Instead of stuff, always looked up kind of crazy. I mentioned uh, another argument. Oh, sir. Uh, yeah. Um, but with you guys, those are the fundamentals of the comic art that you knew when you were younger. You, you say, talk about your first eight years of your career not being very meaningful. Well, it obviously built to what you did in American Flag because that was the platform you built it upon. People mistake my dismissal of that work as false modesty of self-deprecation. No. No. What it is, it's pride in craft. Yeah. It's pride in getting over that bullshit and moving on to this. Yeah, we learn. There's a lot to be said for that. Right. Yes. Comics can be an industry that can chew up and spit out younger artists and the ones who decide if they're going to learn from any mistakes or failures or the company going under or more bounce checks or whatever it is, stick with it, you know. There are people who I'm praying are spit at. <laughs> I literally get up in the morning and I write a your side panel and I say, can this guy's career slip into the ether and just disappear? We know, I, we know the dessert's got nothing to do with it. No, I got a shit list that just continues to grow. <laughs> and I'll share it with you if you're really interested, but after the camera stop rolling. So I said the bill is that you know, I've met her before. I've never met you, but I just wanted to express my appreciation for the fact that I always knew what I was looking at. Even if the kingpin looked like a mountain with a, you know, this tiny face. And this oh, you mean the Spider-Verse? Yeah. <laughs> Knowledge of art, I always knew what I was looking at, and I was never lost. Oh, well, thank you very much. I mean, and that's something... I'm sorry? There were imitators who tried to do what you were doing, but they didn't have the fundamental drawing ability and narrative storytelling. I really do appreciate that. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I was trying to do the things that I did, and then to see other people coming in sort of being influenced by me, like the keen, mm -hmm. you know, and one of the things that sort of hit me after I saw that style mystic arena sort of open up was that for me, again, maybe it's because I, I get bored easily at a certain point. It's like, okay, I've tried this. How can I apply this to a narrative form and not have it just be all about a visual just for its own sake? And one of the things that has always sort of driven me is to kind of continually go back to school. It's like, 
Bernie Fuchs once said, the thing that, that interests him is the effect of light on objects, and that to capture that. And at the end of the day, you can try all kinds of wild techniques, you can try all kinds of abstractions, but the simple ability to draw someone in and make them feel something that resonates, there's a beauty to that and a, and a universality to it. And I kind of feel like at the end of the day, to go back and just dig in again, the idea of learning, continually learning. But it's like you're communicating not just with a giant audience, you're communicating one on one with the reader. But that's the subjective nature of what we're talking about. Right. That's exactly right. right. I mean, I talked about this earlier. I mean, that engaging with you, the reader, is for me at least the biological imperative of what we do. It astonishes me, because the old man Jeff Yadin get off my lawn, <laughs> that we now have a generation, at least two generations, of talent who have, for my money, lost the connection to that relationship with the reader. You start about the reader being the engine. Exactly. That's precisely what I said. Yes. And I believe that with all my heart. There's a reason pagination exists, yeah. that you cannot put a surprise on a right-handed page. Because you turn the yeah. And one of the things that I learned in doing a seminar on Marvel, as long as many years as I did, was just the hobbyist nature of the people who are attracted to the business. That, that calling also applies to people who come in and seem to forget that the minute they start taking money from people, they're professionals now, and they're cogs, and they are part of the corporate structure. Like it or not, tough shit. You know, it's the way it is. If you don't want to, you can do your own stuff. And I find it fascinating that there are two Van Skyvers working in comics. There's Ethan Van Skyver, and there's Noah Van Skyver. They're brothers, apparently. <laughs> that, not a joke. I, I just found this out recently. This is true. I believe this right. is true. If you know Ethan's work and his ethos, and if you know Noah's work and his ethos, it is staggering to me. I've just recently become acquainted with Noah Van Skyver's work. For me, he's a modern day equivalent of what Chester Brown might have evolved into had he not gotten off the deep end about some bizarre obsessions. And I love the engagement his work has with the audience. I really do. It makes me crazy. It makes me want to learn more about that kind of stuff, knowing full well that technically it's completely unavailable for me. I don't have that capacity for self-revelation. I will always mask autobiography because I'm not... I mean, I used to be good-looking enough to be a narcissist. Now I'm just a solo. And it's, it's hard because I want to do stuff that, that's honest and true, but I also don't feel that my own personal story is as interesting as it should be. Because yeah. metaphor is a great place to do that. You've yeah. always been honest and true. Well, yeah. I'm working on the, the second and third office of kids. The second office involves people who aren't dead. That's going to fuck me up. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. And I can say lots of shit about people who are dead. I subscribe to the Sondheim Guns, which is always be going to the dead because they can't defend themselves and you can't hurt their feelings. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm already working on those conflations. I'm trying to figure out how to conflate him because he shows up at the end of the second arc, but not him. But the essence of what he represents, what I said earlier about what he represented. And I'm not sure whether I will include myself. I don't know. I'm already in the first arc, first of the first arc. I'm there. But I watched the Gary Roth interview that Ben Saunders did a couple of years ago over the EC archives that we did. I learned something from that that I hadn't connected before from a snide crack, which I will not tell you about, but I'll tell him later. A guy whose work we admire. Oh, okay. That's how many people do I'm amazed and appalled at the capacity for narcissism that exists on the, the non-mainstream side of comics. Is it because it's so small? I don't know. I tried to read Fun Home, and I just want to punch the book in the face. <laughs> I just, I mean, like, how, why, why, no, it's insufferable. Musicals worse. I mean, now I feel terrible about myself. <laughs> yes. What is the, if there is a hold up on doing a collection of memorial portraits that you share online? No, there's discussions about it. I'm working right now with a publishing company that has worked with Museum of Modern Art. So they're doing three volumes of my stuff. The first one is sort of a retrospective. Second is, I think, calling from about 50 or 60 sketchbooks that I have. And the third one may be about the memorial portraits. Again, I never get any of those for any other reason than to do them. It wasn't anything that I had thought about, but there may be at some point. Omar, I wanted to ask you, when did you guys meet each other? What was you guys' first initial thoughts on, on each other? I remember meeting him at a party that was hosted by Larry Hama in Van Destiny with Larry and Gary, and we were fucked up. Okay, well, it's interesting, because my, my first recollection of actually meeting you, that may have been where we actually spent some time together, right. but the first time I met you was actually when Joe Rubenstein brought me over to, to Upstart. I don't remember Joe ever yeah, being there. Yeah, okay, well he came in, he introduced me, and then you said, 
I like your shit. And I went, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And you looked at me and you looked at Joe and goes, is he for real? <laughs> yeah. No, no memory. But again, yeah. I was a drug addict. It was like, you looked at me like, like, what is this? What kind of idiot? It's because like, yeah. you were raised on a farm and didn't know this shit next stuff. <laughs> no, 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 I was also, I, I couldn't take a compliment, also. <laughs> like taking yes for an answer? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Tell me what Upstart was. Upstart was the, was the bargain basement version of the studio. The studio was Luda, Wrightson, Jones, and, and Smith. Winters. Oh, that's yeah. cool. I'm also Winters and Cabbage. Which is, which is actually another thing we bonded over. I, I forgot to mention that, but I digress. Continue. <laughs> and it's me and Walter. Was, the original was me, Walter, Val Myrick, and Jim Starlin. Val decided to leave and did about telling everybody. He said, Jim Sherman's moving in next week. So yeah, here he is, Jim Sherman. Frank Miller ended up replacing Starlin. This was the late 70s to the mid 80s. Simonson had this huge drawing table, which I think he still has. Literally five feet wide, four feet high. And he works like this. <laughs> Walter has never dipped a pen into a ink bottle in his life. He said he stopped it. Really? He said, Holy shit. Because he used to, that's one of the things. Right? Like, okay. He used to, like, dip the a, a Series 7 Sable. Right. But he would also use 102 Hunt, 102 Crow Quill. And he would actually take the ink <laughs> dropper, squeeze some ink through it, hold the pen laterally, and just drip in <laughs> and then go back, back and then continue. As Never did was, drugs. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Has had three pina coladas and two beers. <laughs> In total, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, and he didn't finish the last minute a lot. So he said he recently. I think he said, said like this is like the apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys brought up Hunter S. Thompson. Your disagreement over that. It just got me to thinking. How, of course, any discussion about comics talks about comic books, but how important is it to you to use like or to draw inspiration or references from other sources like movies, novels? Uh, the news, whatever, in you know, television, uh, how often do you do that? I think Bill and I are the living incarnations of precisely that. I do think that there are areas of overlap, and I think there are areas of, of absolute exclusivity and you know, mutual exclusivity. I think you're far more into your awareness of guys like Hammond. That's 40 years old. Right. I mean, for me, I'm deeply influenced by musical theater. Usually mm -hmm. so, and I'm very serious about that. Frank Lesser is as much an influence on me as a writer as Alan First or Elmer Leonard. I realized recently how much of an influence Fritz Leiber was on, on the, way I, the way I think about humor. But in terms of picture making, I look at everything. You know, I really do. It's amazing what kind of goes in there. You can't turn it off. It's just whatever, you know, whatever you're looking at, whatever you're experiencing, like there's some way that this is going to link in. I was going to ask you, what is this, the oddest reference or influence that if you were to tell them who it is, that people would go like, I never would have heard that. I never would have believed that. I, it's probably Lesser. That's from a book that David gave me about life under the occupation in Paris. I like that stuff. But Lesser would be the answer. Okay. For me, <laughs> Guys and Dolls is as close as America's ever gotten to perfect art. I feel the same way about Most Happy Fella and How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. His sense of the vernacular just kills me. We were discussing doing Black History 3, and I wanted to do it as a parody of musicals. And I realized I, had, I didn't have an account for that, so I couldn't do it. Because I'm not Larry Siegel you know, from that. But I really wanted to, because I wanted to do literal 10 page long parodies of musicals in filth and do pornographic versions of West Side Story, <laughs> guys and all, seriously. Uh, you know, sometimes awesome. you just gotta come up with something else to do to keep you excited. <laughs> what about like someone like Billy Wilder? Yes. Yeah, you know, for, except for someone like Hot No, and Sally like 17, no, no, you're right, everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right, you're right. Because all of them, I mean, like the, the three archetypes are, you know, William Holden, and James Garner. And Garner, when you were talking about, in fact, more than 20 years after the fact, there's a wonderful piece by James Garner reviewing his biography, his autobiography, and he talks about Garner, why Garner didn't become a movie star, and Clint Eastwood and Stephen King did. It's an astonishing piece of work. It really is. I like a lot of James Garner. And to a great extent, that Wiley does represent that kind of snarky new American. We tried to watch the band hotel last night, and my wife couldn't bear it. But I'm, I'm watching this. I'm thinking of Garbo and Ninochka. What about jazz for you? Uh, it's like you young and Charlie Parker and, and Count Basie to connect. And of course, all the vocal leads. Oh, all singer, Eddie Jefferson, King Pleasure. There I go, there I go, there I go, there I go. The reason I'm, I'm kind of curious about Parker, because Parker was all about just... Man. Yeah, exactly. So, same thing with, I'm thinking, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, 
Like Coleman, John Coleman. Col Col yeah, right. uh, Coleman and Coltrane. Coleman. Coleman. I got my grandson to sing a Love Supreme with me this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> love Supreme. Come on, Rob, you do it. A love Supreme. There's nothing like a nine-year-old kid from Mill Valley, California, <laughs> singing a Love Supreme with you. It's the best. <laughs> Him, I don't embarrass. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Seven-year-old bad guy. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, Bill, when you talked about going up to DC that first time, just what year was that? I think it was 1980. That late? I think I think it was like maybe been 79 or 80. Yeah, I, earlier than that. I, I just turned. I think it was yeah June of I think 80. And what I want to ask both of you is the way you did panels is really unconventional when you compare it to when you're talking about Kurt Swan, Murphy Anderson, or the Marvel guys. They're just six panels a page, very simple. Were the editors you're dealing with? <laughs> When you started to do that, was there a pushback on them that they didn't want it? I mean, were there editors that did? Because, like, I feel I see some of the pages you're doing, they're so great. And then I see, you know, editor in chief, Jim Shooter. And I'm like, how did that happen? Keeping Jim occupied. Well, no, that, was, that, came, yeah. that came later. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Talk about a Hollywood Babylon, a comic book Babylon. <laughs> That shows up in, in volume three. Yeah. I mean, there were more things. I remember going to Benny Coletta's house in New Jersey. I don't know if Nixon was a neighbor at some point, if, if, but he was, Vince was like, he wanted to be the art director up at Marvel. And he was, no, he came very close to it. It was Mike Hobson. What happened was Vinny was going around to all the editors saying, you know, it's like, you're basically screwing over Jim big time. He goes, and when I'm the art director, you're out of here. He was like basically <laughs> threatening everybody. He was like pulling walnuts. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, 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 it's absolutely true. He was a low level, I think he was a, like a bookie or something. Right, but, yeah. but, 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 you know, that's exactly the character he played in the office. Right. And the thing is, is that he was so certain that he had the job down that it was actually Hobson at the time who called him and said, You're not getting the job. Marvel cannot be associated with people with, such as yourself. Such, <laughs> like, yeah, he went somebody else. It's like mob kind of thing. Yeah. The, the pushback you're talking about happens today, not then. Revenues are much more conservative yeah. now than they were. Yeah. Oh yeah, Shooter was actually Jim got a lot of crap, a lot of heat. He used to bust my chops all the time, but he was the first person to say, "Do your thing." Also, one thing that you don't see anymore is if you do a piece of art and they go and they make a lunchbox of it, or they go and they they make a you know a half <coughs> meal or whatever, paying for something twice. You know, if you do a cover, it's like and they make a T-shirt out of it. All of that stuff. Jim would go upstairs to the powers that be and say, you got to pay the guy again for the job. He's already done it, like pay him again. And they would. You don't see that at all now. Things have gotten much, much more conservative. Both companies, mostly because neither company has any artists working as editors. I mean, the firing of John Mark Trello two months ago shocked everybody, but it was no surprise to people like that. Because right. I think the reason that he was fired is because no one knows what an art director does. Thomas has become ridiculously a writer alpha media, which is absurd. And there are three main reasons for this. We've had this conversation. The editors themselves have no real understanding of visual narrative. Their criticisms are filtered entirely through the literary screen. And what you've got is three things. A, the 90s, when comics were really sensation-based without narrative. Two, with all due respect, the curiosity and the, the level of interest of the reader has diminished dramatically. How many grown men and women in this room are spending too much fucking time reading Mott and Jane and Harry Potter novels? And three, I'm sorry, grow up and, um, and stop reading that shit. It's children's books. They're called chapter books for kids. And three, it is in the interest of the representation and, and management classes to identify the writer as a creative force in the material and the artist as an unfortunately necessary but unpleasant adjunct to the writer's creative experience. Because those guys can identify the skill set required to write and be able to write, but they, they know what a keyboard looks like. And sort of get the idea. But when it comes to us, we are regarded as shamans. There's a reason why the chief runs the room and the shaman works for the chief. And Gil always said that he felt that he was a wolf being held at bay by a uh, torch. And I can see what he's talking about. The writer in, in comics is the alpha, and the reason that the company like Image is so successful right now is because it's an ID factor. <coughs> I think I'm one of the few guys in Image who actually writes and draws his own stuff. I'm in the middle there. Having done both things for a living, <laughs> I have a genuine distaste for these. Every time I read a deadline, when some writer refers to it, the person with whom they collaborate as their artist. 
like I thought about my lunch. <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter is comic book writing is not typing. Comic book writing is a collaborative experience between the writer and the artist. And when you react to the quality of the writing in a comic book, what you're actually reacting to is the execution of the writer's template by the artist. So, shut up all you guys. <laughs> also, the one other big thing that is part and parcel of now, he said, it really isn't about storytelling, it's about IP. You mm -hmm. know, it's really about, you know, how can we take this and turn it into a ride, turn it into maybe a movie or something. But it's really not about the comics, per se, at all. And I rather like comic books. Yeah. I consider myself very lucky in that I left New York the day before I turned 35 because I had no prospect of this guy. Despite the fact that it refers to me as a star, I'm a legend. <laughs> and, uh, and in that regard, I realized I had to find another income stream because I was going to get this old and I had no idea how I was going to support myself. I did not want to be a trainer on the state. I'm on the, on the board of the Hero Initiative. And you have no idea how difficult it is occasionally for me to have to deal with people who treat me with contempt when I was in my 20s and 30s when I come there with their hands out. And I'm a Democrat. We'll name names later. And uh, I'm grateful for the fact that I found another income stream because I never could have had the life that I live today in comics. Because I'm just not a complex. I'm, I'm an acquired taste. Had I done what I did on Flag and Times Squared on Batman or Superman, as potential, that would be a bigger name. But I would have been able to get away with those things on those established characters. You couldn't do that. It could not be done. Ned Khan always gave me shit for not doing Flag for DC Comics. And I said, that's absurd. DC would never have published the book as a delivery. Because it needed a company without baggage. It needed to be in a place where there was no history whatsoever that it could establish itself alone. But existing alongside Superman and Batman would have given it a, a, a patina of a specific idea which it lacked and desperately wanted to avoid at that point. The downside of that, of course, is that it became material that influenced a big part of the talent pool but didn't reach the audience. I spent more time than I cared to admit explaining to Schmuck's interviewing me that you might want to do your research before you talk to me next time. No, I didn't get that from him. He got that from me. You know, I'm not tired of sounding like a bitter old fucking Jew. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> the provenance in terms of what comes first. That's the other thing is that I think people tend to forget the linear aspect of it, that there are things that have actually happened in a very much a chronological point of way. What you were saying about, um, I'm blanking on, on what your point was, being pushed back from that. Well, yeah, when, when you started, I assumed there'd be more pushback from the guys who'd been there since the 40s. But they weren't around anymore. They were gone. By the time I think. When we talk more mid 70s, when there's people like Julie Schwartz and Mark Langhinger still around. The only guy that Julie wanted to work with was, was Dave Howell. Dave was Julie's favorite artist. He's reminded him of Murphy Anderson. We weren't working for those guys, mm -hmm. ever. We worked for Danny, we worked for Archie, we worked for younger guys. I wanted to take a shot. Of all people, Jesus Christ, what's his name? The awful little Terry. Joe Orlando is He was not Terry. Joe was a genuine guy. Those guys never had anything to do with us. You were never first here. I was never first here. They weren't going to let us do Superman or Batman. When Jordana comes over to DC from Charlton, he brings up Harrow. He's the perfect guy. Harrow is the perfect cautionary tale. Milgram spent five years trying to get Harrow to come over to work at Marvel. But Harrow mistook his loyalty for, to Jordano for his loyalty for DC. Jordan was gone, you know, apparel is smoke. Yeah, speaking of apparel, there was a point when, and again, this is part of my issue with comics, that there is no gold watch in the media. You're pretty much on that treadmill, and they pay you just enough to kind of just keep churning it out. So I was actually inking through finishes over Jim Apparel. What is this? In the 80s, oh, Batman. Uh, you know, Batman stuff, yeah. Now they, they must have looked fabulous. Well, what's interesting about it is that they came to me. Who was running? Skates or Dan? I really don't recall. Okay. But I do know that they wanted me, because at that point, he'd been in business for so long. And this is something that happens, and you can saw it with Kirby, you saw it with Buscema. Stuff starts to skew. It starts to get wonky. They just don't have either the vision, you know, the eyesight anymore, or the enthusiasm. It's like they're just putting stuff out there. These are the people who would sort of built the business, built the medium in a lot of ways, who should be treated with a lot more respect. I mean, certainly that's the way I feel about it, but... Well, give that shit up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the point is, when they actually came to me and they said, we want you to do finishes over stuff, and they said, can you fix a lot of what he does? It's kind of wonky. Was it wonky? It was getting kind of wonky, yeah. yeah. A lot of that sort of... He had a little bit of a Neil Adams thing yeah. happening. A lot of that went by the wayside. It sort of became this sort of blocky flattened out kind of thing that was going on. And actually, I never met Jim, but we did have a conversation one time. We spent about an hour and a half on the phone talking and talked about everything. It was really actually great. The only thing I really do remember about the whole thing was at the end of the conversation, he said, I have a favor to ask of you. 
And I said, you name it. He said, stop fucking with my faces. And I said, <laughs> okay. And I called up the editor and I said, pencil is prerogative. It's like, you hired me to fix his drawings, quote, fix. And he wants me to be more respectful of what he's doing. And pretty much right after that, there wasn't any more work from him. It was almost like that was the end of the whole thing. Just acknowledging I was going to follow his request. That was it. That was all she wrote. For both or either of you, was there any particular project or turning point that you changed your perspective of yourself as an artist from struggling artist to pro or that you're most proud of? Or? I can put that to bed right now. It's always a struggle. I'm sorry. It's like it just never stops. You know, it just never ends. It's like there's no romance <laughs> at all. For me, it was flagging because I realized I had something to say that I could do. I think what he's talking about, you're always working hard, you end up competing with yourself. For me, the thing about flying is I set a bar for myself that screwed me. Because I can never go back. It was a game changer. In fact, this, this is my job. Comic book enthusiasts hate to hear this shit. But the reality is, we get paid to do this. And I get up in the morning, when we started this conversation earlier, I said that one of the separating factors of the generation precedes yeah. us is that bitterness. I don't think you're a bitter guy. I'm not a bitter guy. I mean, I'm bitter about other things. I'm mostly bitter about, you know, about the fact that I resent other people in money more than anything else. <laughs> I envy very few people's work though I envy. I envy, I really like to be making a living, you know, testing it artisanal macaroni and cheese <laughs> and be able to do my, my work on the side, you know. Sure. But I kind of like, I'm a crossword puzzle guy. I do puzzles. I can't read it at night. I have to do puzzles and the narrative gets me worked up. And I do only Thursday through Sunday because the money is a message for you. I feel that way about doing comics today. That's how I feel about comics. I feel like comics today have more in common with map making, cartography, and schematics. Finding ways to deliver narrative imagery in ways that is appealing, that has some clarity, but is also obscurantist in places. Because my feeling is there are other people who are there to laugh into the audience, and I'm not here for that. Somebody pointed out, and I was like, well, yeah, I'll do stuff that characters do that isn't laid out in the text. Oh, yeah. A lot of guys don't. I know you do. There's so much subtext. It's like Willie Elder. Yeah. Willie Elder? No. No. <laughs> Who does not know Willie Elder? He fucked up his career by spending 25 years doing the Laney fame. But before that, he was an astonishing, talented man. He was a maybe Kurtzman's greatest collaborator. They were best friends. And his humor stuff was packed with what he called chicken back. There was, was all this stuff happening in the background that he just added for fun, you know? He was apparently a very eccentric guy. Uh, I met him a couple of times. I made no impression on him because I was young and he didn't give a shit about me. Anecdotally, he was crazy. And that craziness showed up on the page. I mean, he, in the middle of the Depression, when money was tight, he found a package of meat that had fallen off a pusher truck. Rather than bringing it home to feed his family, he stole clothes off a clothesline and scattered the meat and the clothes along a railroad track and started yelling, Mikey! Mikey! <laughs> That's fucking nuts. <laughs> yeah. So that should make it a it's That's a commitment. You know, that, that is a commitment. <laughs> so, to what Ted was saying, I think, all along the way with me, with like, with coming in with the Moon Knight, Moon Knight had a very specific, that was my, Cutting my eye teeth, you know, so to speak. And with the, the Adams routine, then pushing into the new mutants, I felt like I was trying some stuff with all of the other influences in black and white. Then when I did Electra, that was like, I wanted to do painted covers and painted interiors, because again, you had done it with the like, graphic novels, but I wanted to do it in a monthly comic that was actually about a superhero stuff, like doing it in that. I wanted to just write and draw, tell my own thing. And again, response I got from the U.S. when coasters came out here in the United States, they'd have these four old ladies, like there was some magazine that would have like, it wasn't quite four stars, it was a unit of four, like four, I'm like four old ladies. Yeah. Well, it was, I think it, it was, I went into this it was, it was, a, but I got four question marks, but coasters were reviewed by the London Sunday Times book review, and it was actually this amazingly positive, like it shows the adult potential of the four, and I'm like, I never felt like I was like I was not a superhero writer, but I felt like I loved the idea of complexity and writing stuff that with the same way that I guess that the way I approach my artwork, I feel like my words are probably about as much of fully compatible with that. It's like as far as writing a monthly superhero thing, I don't think I could do that. And I'm in awe of someone who can. Again, referring to this essay, which I'll be probably probably medium, the journal is probably gonna publish it as well. 
I have no interest whatsoever in superhero comic books as a reader. I haven't in years. I find them adolescent and insipid. And I don't care whether you like them or not, you're welcome to read them. <laughs> but I am genuinely in awe of anyone who can find anything new to say about this shit. Because it is just, it's 80 years of this junk. It boils down to, as I said, the road to Ernie Coyote. It's Batman chasing the Joker, never catching him. Superman Luther, Spider Man Green Goblin, it's just endless, you know. I'm sitting on an airplane. And I'm watching the, the Everybody Dies movie, but not really, you know, uh, over a guy's shoulder. And I'm realizing that this is a paradigm of comics. That there's no consequences, there's no real context of consequences. And that I can't participate in that as a professional and take it seriously. But I am stunned at anyone who can step up to the plate and say, I'm going to write Superman for the next couple of years. But then to your viewpoint, we get comics like Twilight. Yeah, maybe. But John Byrne also said that I had raped an entire aspect of the DC universe. Word, man. <laughs> That's my favorite thing you ever done. Really? Yeah. Like JGL said, huh? Well, yeah. He's pretty gorgeous, isn't he? <laughs> and if comics were meritocracy, yeah. he would have to be taken seriously. Which was dialogue, actually. I don't mean to derail the whole thing, but the way you wrote the way they spoke, every character in there had their own unique voice. That's <laughs> what <laughs> And it had an ending. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, comic books, but that's the reality. I mean, comic books have conditioned you people to read shit. <laughs> because, because it flatters you for liking it. It's like television used to be. Television used to be a medium that congratulated you for being too hip for television. And as soon as they had you convinced of that, they had you by the balls. And mainstream comic books are fatuous and credulous and depend on your fatuousness and your credulity. They depend on you still loving the shit you loved when you were 13. <laughs> they depend on you being willing to accept the creations of 15-year-old boys aimed at not quite so talented and skilled 15-year-old boys with a slather of gravitas to make you feel like you're reading an adult product. The guy dresses up like a bondage freak, beating the shit out of people he doesn't know in the <laughs> middle of the night. He had a bad day when he was eight. <laughs> okay? The guy has power beyond a mortal man, okay? And he comes down and he's nice. Really? <laughs> Come on. What do you think would really happen if he came down here? He wouldn't wear that red cape. <laughs> no, no, no. Anecdotally, back when Jeanette was in DC, which they wanted to be group the superhero, the main characters, Alan, Frank, and I were asked to come in and pitch Superman. Alan was going to do The Adventures of Superman, Frank was going to do action, I was going to do the third book. And I pitched my version of Superman. You want to hear my pitch? Yes. Okay. okay. You okay? Yeah, All right. All right. <laughs> Basically, it's the first three pages of a series of multi-panel pages as Metropolis awakens. Alarm clocks go off. Everybody's waking up in Metropolis. The, the city's beginning. It's just, you set the city. Every, it's not New York, it's Chicago. Metropolis in my head is Chicago, no matter what you think. Because that's the city that, that Siegel and Schuster been. And the bus is moving. And everybody's waking up. And then you, you have like four or five pages of these multi-panel And then all of a sudden, everybody looks up on a nine-panel page. As you begin to hear, speaking of Frank Besser, you've got the cool, clear, Eyes of a seeker of wisdom and truth. Slightly off kid. And as you turn the page, there's Superman flying across the metropolis, and he's singing along to how to succeed in business without a train. He flies to the Daily Planet, he gets into the Daily Planet to the storage closet, dresses up, and then we realize as he interacts with Lois and Jimmy and Perry and everybody else, everybody in the metropolis knows that Clark Kent is Superman. <laughs> They're not going to let him know they <laughs> Because they really like the idea of having Superman in the trap. <laughs> Needless to say, I was shunted out of the room. <laughs> See, that's a Superman I can dig. All right, it's Superman by Tom DeHaven. Who's read it? Not I bought it. Well, I bought it because of you, but I haven't read it. Oh. <laughs> Who's bought it and read it? I read it. Made me cry halfway across the country. Because it brought back to me what it was about superhero comic books that I loved when I was 12 years old. Okay, I called Tom DeHave when I got home and I said, if anybody adapts this thing, I'd kill to be that guy. You know who would do a great job on that? Chris Sandy. He would do a fabulous job on that. But all that romance has been sucked out of superhero comic books by the need to make it relevant and adult. It should be morally idiotic at its core. It's what made that stuff so perfectly beautiful when we were kids. Instead, you've got adult problems of like the guys who run around dressed in super suits. I'm sorry. Stop. Yes? But is that a flaw of yes. 
I'm sorry. I'm being facetious. I'm sorry. Hey, hey, hey. No, go ahead. Please go ahead. Um, is that a flaw? What you just said is that a flaw of the genre itself? Just yes. inherent. I think or it is. Or is it a function of the current editorial? No, I think it is a function of the material itself. I really do. I think that the very nature of adolescent satisfaction fantasies, which is what we're talking about here. First of all, for the most part, these characters are projections of the 15 year old boy's idea of adulthood. Grown men and women, when confronted with the idea of dressing like that in public, do not behave that way. They have shame. <laughs> they have a sense of self. They have a sense of awareness. A 15 year old boy's idea of how an adult behaves is how these characters behave. I do comic books because of superhero comics. It's all I really wanted to do. I love this stuff so much. Batman in my head is drawn by Dick Sprang. <laughs> and Superman in my head is drawn by Jack Burnley. And it's not a realistic guy, it's a cartoon. I can watch the Fleischer cartoons now with my grandsons and still get goose pimples and go berserk. From the endless reaches of space, where they once wrote a planet on a script on, they burn like a glowing star in the distance. You know, I can get almost all of that. L, IAB, IAP, IS, which is the initials for a look, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. How pathetic is that? <laughs> okay. So this is not contempt prior to investigation, this is contempt with investigation. This is me calling out, wishing to God, the God I don't believe in, I that there was more to genre material than just these guys running around in masks and caves fighting crime for no particular reason. Hey, but you got a finger up in the air. You got so it leads to my next question. Which is? Do you guys follow European comics and the stuff that they're printing, and have you been approached by them to be able to do original material? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of, of European stuff. And I'm actually having some discussions about doing some stuff here. But what you're bringing up is sort of what I want to get to with, with, with you, and I want to hear your answer as well. But By the way, this, sorry this, for the screen. No, but. it actually begs the question, because there's the, the medium of comic, because I still love this medium and what it's capable of. But you reminded me of, like, I think a number of people here have heard about the whole Bill Maher thing. Have you heard of oh, that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I was going to say that he got... No, no, but he, but he wasn't talking about comic books. No. He, he wasn't talking about comic books at all. He was talking about the movies. Yeah. He is no idea what comic books. He barely knows comic books exist. Okay, well, I mean... Comic book movies have taken over the world. I mean, let, let's face it. Here's the only genius in comics today is Kevin Feige. Kevin Feige has taken, in 10 years' time, has monetized to the tune of billions material based on source material that 99.99% of the people buying those tickets have any idea exists, and if they do, they couldn't give a fuck. They just don't give a damn. The comic book movie is the engine that Bill Maher was talking about. I doubt he has even the conscious awareness of the existence of the product we're talking about. There are only a quarter of a million people of us in the United States. That's right. When John Cassidy's and Jason Aaron's Star Wars number one came out, I had lunch with Bob Wayne that day. And Bob is one of my oldest friends. And that was the first topic of news. And, and, so, and before either of us, it was like one of those Ted Coke moments. We said, so four copies each or what? And yeah, that's what it's all about. He wasn't talking about the comics. He has no comics. First of all, getting worked up about what Bill Maher thinks. No, no, no. I, I, I totally agree with you. But if you followed any of on social, you saw how much of a... Because they're feeling, they're feeling this hurt. Their cherishment was being assaulted. And, you know, when did, would anybody else think that what you like means shit to you? I get up every morning and I say to myself, reminding myself that what you think of me is not my business. <laughs> And it's really difficult, but it's really good. <laughs> you know, if you need to feel the need to defend your taste of some guy on TV, start questioning your taste. <laughs> Fuck him, what is, who cares what he thinks? <laughs> you know, Christ, God, for God's sake. All those, again, all those Christ and God's sake. Who cares? I love TV, and I like a lot of stuff, but I don't think it's getting good because I like it. You know, I like pizza. I had great pizza at lunch. I did it. Though. It's not good. It's pizza. <laughs> you know, right? You're but the problem with European comics is that, for the most part, they lack the energy of the better genre material of American comics. The best European comics have a state look. Taconi, okay, Giardino, okay, yeah, Giardino. Giardino is what Mobius would have been like if he went to work for Giorgi instead of Gigi. Oh right? <laughs> right? Am I right? Think about it. You know Vittorio Giardino? Giardino is astonishing. His work is stayed. His range of character is unfucking believable. There's no capes and shit in this. And it's rather stayed and quiet, but it is rife with character and rife with drama. Fernando Taconi, you know? Taconi's the closest to American. That's because he was working for Fleetwood. But most of the European stuff is really badly written. 
The writing is terrible. It's worse than ours, and we suck. <laughs> okay? And that is an issue. I mean, I hate translating stuff anyway. You know, that girl with the spider tattoo? How many times do you people get on a robot like a truck? You. Could you elaborate a little bit more about what you talk about about the subjective experience or encounter that the audience should have in fronting a page of comic book art? Yeah. You well, can I mean, I check, you know, you can explain A that. character literally looking out of the page and looking at you, okay. acknowledging your existence. It's the antithesis, I mean, in a movie that doesn't work, breaking the fourth wall is a terrible idea. And I'm not talking about like Deadpool and tacos and all the chimichangas bullshit. You know, I'm, not talking about that <laughs> I'm talking more about literally the character identifying your presence. Not looking off to the side, but identifying you as a part of the experience. It's like a close up on a page <laughs> has several functions, deeper sense of detail on what this character looks like. It's also there to tell you how that character feels and how you should feel about what that character is experiencing. And that's heightened when that character makes eye contact with you. Does that make sense? Are you talking about situations where the character is speaking to the audience? I'm not speaking to the audience, but, the but staying in such a way that the character is looking out at yeah. you. Okay. Not looking off to the side, not being oblique, but engaging. You're talking about the character is still engaged with the people within the... the, the, the uh, yes, but the visually, power. yes, yes. This book I mentioned earlier, there was nothing but middle distance shots, everything was brown, all the characters looked alike, <laughs> there was no physical connection, there was no behavior of their bodies, okay? I talk with my hands. We're both active people. We both represent the tradition of paying attention. To, I mean, I spend enormous parts of my life watching people. I eat alone frequently. And I watch people while they're behaving. And I love this stuff because it gives me character moments and character business. I'm looking at this room full of people. Some of you were thinking, some of you were like looking like, what the fuck? <laughs> and it's, it's fun for me. This is where my pleasure arrives. And that relationship between the text and, and, and the reader can never be overestimated. Important. So there's a life beyond the page. Yes, exactly. That you're made a participant in the material. You know, when it happens in a movie, I mean, have you ever seen The Lady in the Lake with Robert Montgomery playing the Philip Marlowe? It's terrible. It's a film shot completely subjective. Okay, the camera is Philip Marlowe. It is awful. It completely wastes a wonderful actor in Robert Montgomery. Okay. The female lead is the best name I've ever. Her name is Audrey Totter. Great name for an actress. But that subjectivity works really beautifully in comics. <laughs> Jack, yes, sir. Yes. I read all your stuff, both of you, in the 80s and everything. And I got through, reached the end of the decade. I was reading, you know, War Mature, and there's all this great stuff going on. And I was, you know, uh, out of the work, like, it, it's going to stop doing superheroes. I was thrilled. I was like, great, I'll go with that. And then everything in the 90s, it was like everybody doubled down on superheroes. And the only thing, the only kind of things that uh, interested me, because I still wanted to read the genre material. DC would do the Elseworld books. So I pick up stuff like Thrill Killer and that kind of thing. Always wishing, I was like, man, I wish I could read this without the Batman stuff in it. Because I liked it, but I just didn't. Sometimes you start taking the job you get. No, I understand. Don't you ever feel that? Do you ever feel that you that sometimes you just got to do the job to pay some mortgage? Oh, yeah, yeah. Those are yeah, no, yeah. Oh, I don't feel blind. I have a love suspicion today. Mm -hmm. I love all of that stuff, but at the same time, I'm like, it'd be nice to have pirate stories without fucking I mean, Superman in the division or whatever. I remember expecting that there was going to be stuff like the book that you had planned at one time, April in Paris. Right. Set in Paris, set in. Drawn by Dennis Oh, I thought you were going to. No, no, Dennis and I talked about it somewhere. Why is he here? I don't know. Fun. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just told Dennis Cowan to fuck. <laughs> you answered a lot of my question in a couple of answers already. Your growing hatred of some of the creators, and you know, you said you're Mrs. Girl. Oh, it's getting bigger. You're, right. right. you're not on it, so it's okay. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know that. You know that going in. Yeah, yeah. I find, and I don't know if you agree, that a lot of it, for me, and why I don't love a lot of comic anymore, is because it went from a storytelling genre to people who now want to draw a bunch of cool pictures. Like, I grew up learning about storytelling <laughs> and hopefully drawing it and And, and, <laughs> and I feel like a lot of people now have grown up looking at artists who they thought their work looked cool and they tried to emulate them and they forgot the storytelling aspect of what they were doing. Would you agree with that? But then you get a guy who can't know you. Absolutely. You know what I mean? 
Here's a guy. I'm talking about your growing list. Most of my list is not personal number. It's, it's all personal, not professional. Okay. I just like a lot of people on personal list. Uh, but I'm, again, but I'm, even, I'm so dislikable, it's okay. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not walking the park, and I know that. <laughs> Bill's a much nicer person than I am. Oh, yeah, I he, you know, he really is. Huh? Not a tough job. <laughs> <laughs> One of the easiest jobs he's ever going to do. It goes back, I think, to the fact that the comic book market has shrunk so much, and people tend to... I think it's an easily flattered audience, you know? And I think the audience really engages in that flattering. I think one of the almost prerequisites for success is the sharing of the zeitgeist. Is a belief system that crosses over from the I think there are artists who are extremely popular because they represent what the audience would do if it could. It's kind of like the Axel Rose syndrome. Axel Rose was a successful musical figure because I think he was a guy who was like a, a blue collar idea that, that the audience felt they could identify with and become. And that talent is often very much the guy that in comics that, that succeeds. I won't name names, he knows who we're talking about. I just wonder um, like, if some people are trying to be stars as Well, define what you mean by just pretty pictures or cool pictures. Or don't name names. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but just trying a bunch of shit on the page that, you know, excites the artist and not part of the story. I Again, want, you're also just talking about posters. You were saying earlier, like, talking about trying to sell things as opposed to telling stories. In the course of this interview that Groff did with Ben Saunders, they were talking to Bray Lance about Krigstein. And Krigstein is one of those guys that every young fan hates. And if you grow up and if you develop eyes and a head, you realize how brilliant the work is. It's very cold, it's very impersonal, it's very detached. But in its own way, it shares that, that detachment with Kurtzman. Mm. And Krigstein historically hated Splash Man. He just did. If you look at the best stuff he did, he was clearly getting away with not doing Splash. And I also learned to hate Splash. I like starting my stories right in the middle. I'll do a Splash page. I just did a, a job for Marvel last month. A war story that I had to do a splash because it just is it's a Marvel job, it's a straight up job. But I'm not a good draftsman on my own. I'm not a good writer on my own. The two things come together and create a synergy of skill set, and that's what it's about for me. I mentioned this to Bill at that dinner. My stuff works when it's all together. That's one of the reasons why I believe there is a vocabulary, there is a syntax to what we do, there's a structure and structure to narrative, that there are books that are not served by the artist. As much antipathy as I have for the writer, I'm also in, in situations frequently find myself where the artist is not set up for the plate to provide motif. I won't name names sir, because I, I like the guy personally. But there's a book that came out from DC last year that was just right for motif, cleverly written, smartly written. And the artist just dropped the ball on finding all the elements that supported this character and really getting it after the fact that people are talking about both comics. But the problem is that most people who get into comic books don't care about reading or writing anymore. They care about drawing cool shit. But if they get schooled, look, I come back out of apprenticeship. I had a shit kick out of me by Bill Kane, by Gray Morrow, by Wallace Wood, by Neil Adams to a certain extent. And I learned how to do my craft by watching and listening to other guys. Okay? And I've always had assistance. You know, it was my feeling is I can't pay those guys. They're going to pass it on. Okay? And I taught myself how to be as good as I am. I started shitting. I got good. And my commitment to everybody I've ever hired is that I will get you to do better work for me than you do for yourself. Because I'm harder on you than you'll ever be because you're a lazy ass motherfucker. And I'm lazy by nature, but I've taught myself not to be. But a lot of it has to do with beyond instinct and in looking at information, recognizing that pictures can't have narrative value. In the craziest shit he's ever done, there's still narrative value. That show Legion owes a shitload to him. Not visually, but textually. Because Bill's depiction, of the lunacy of superheroes. And see, for me, it's the new mutant stuff. It's really coarse. It's really core. And it's just like crazy ass shit. And it has enormous emotional content. The electric stuff is more detached. There is a little bit more of a, of a removal. And a little bit more of a throwing everything at the page. Literally, as I recall. Yeah, literally. literally. You know. One thing was trying to find a way to encapture, you know, encapsulate different mindsets that were actually of the characters through emotion and through abstraction and through basically deviating from a very sort of standard point of view in terms of a style. It's like zigzagging. It's almost like a Rorschach test to get to what's underneath the character. And that's where I, I certainly believe that 
like again, I think power to feel the same way. It's like presuming a level of intellect on the part of the reader. Right. It's like they're not idiots. Yeah. So the idea of like for me, like one of the things when you talk about pretty pictures, it struck my nerve with me because I'm thinking about all the stuff I'm working on right now with Parisian White. And I'm doing a lot of single page images. And a lot of them are sort of set up. Dumb. I know they're going to be in there somewhere. I don't know exactly how I'm going to place them or where they're going to be. But each one of them has to have a narrative point of view. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with motifs. And I feel like that's also part and parcel of what an artist has to bring to it, is a sense of, again, motif is perfect to perfect. <coughs> Something that will be, again, even musically. Listen to music, the Morricone stuff for What's Upon a Time in the West. Mm -hmm. Each one of the characters has a light motif. It's like you know that when they play this, stuff it's harmonica it's like you bring those elements in visually and what that does is it sits in the readers back of their brain and if a writer is actually smart they'll take those visual motifs and it becomes more than words more than pictures it becomes <clears throat> the synthesis of the two so Ryan Azzarello and Eduardo Reese sure absolutely this work looks like it's the work of one person okay if Brian has any self-awareness you should be lighting a candle with Eduardo every month. <laughs> what, what, I'm about, what I'm saying is that you get that. Is that why your list is growing? No, no, that. my list is all personal. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, my thing, I don't care. I, I really don't care about other people's work. I have to ask because my lack of interest in a lot of us coming out now. Oh, no, me, it's all personal. Is that it's <laughs> just about, it seems as if it should, the artists are going, hey, I want this to be a cool t-shirt, as opposed to what story we're trying to tell in this specific. I agree with you. I, I could give a shit. It makes a fucking t-shirt, you know? Right. It's like, it's got to have a reason. And I've also found this out in terms of, say, painted images. Single painted images are meant to be portal. Images where there's just line and an economy of words and pictures. And they can be done with digital coloring or whatever. But the narrative aspect of it is that the old classic thing of it's important what goes on between the panels, what's in between the, the gutter there, as opposed to what's happening in the panels. So you can actually have staccato, 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 movement, 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 telling the story, turn the page, double page spread, something that where people will land on it and you want them to just slow down and take it in. It's an orchestral aspect to it. You're in control of all of that in terms of how much time someone should spend on a page. Look, there are three schools of storytelling in comics. Eisenman invents everything. Whatever distaste I have for him personally, and he is on the show. I despise him. Just an awful human being. He invented everything. When Jack Kirby's working in the 1940s, he's doing it. And I didn't know this at the time, because I only looked at DC Comics from the Three Golden Age. It's Marvel's just ugly. I didn't know how good the quality stuff was and how much of what Eisenman was doing there. It isn't until Kirsten comes along in the early 50s and you see that the interest is an entirely different way of thinking about narrative. That thinking is to literally step back from Eisner's melodrama and romance to a kind of an almost detached, like a dead gaze, is what he's doing there. Everybody else at EC is doing Eisner. The science fiction books, the horror books, they're all doing Eisner. Okay. And then, due to solely economic reasons, is the third element that develops. That's Kirby did. Because if you look at Jack's stuff, you look at Marvel over the first five, six years of the company, as when Jack makes Stan, Jack ceases to be an action artist, becomes an impact artist. The stuff starts moving. The pictures become about the impact as opposed to getting there. All that in between element, the challenge of the unknown on the airplane changing costume, that vanishes. And what you've got now is writers seeking to achieve that Kirby Lee effect with Eisner technique. That's what's going on. That's why you get guys writing a 12 panel page for Jim Frank Cho. What the fuck do you do giving Frank Cho 12 panels a page? You, you can do that with Chris Sandney. You can do it with David Aha. But Frank, Frank is deliberately illustrative talent. You need to have air and space. And there's nothing there. It's a complete misalignment between the two talents, the two skill sets. And the problem is artists collude in allowing the writer to be the alpha by behaving like amateur dicks. They don't deliver, they don't do what they say they're gonna do, they fuck around, they think that a month has six weeks, you know? I mean, come on. It's that hobbyist sensibility. Cause like you got a lot of guys who came into comics today, who came into comics because of the 90s. And again, those books were elaborate, sensory experiences, utterly bereft of narrative. So you've got a capacity for reading that just it diminishes, it just keeps going down, okay? 
Next. <laughs> you out here? I'm here. All right, drive safe and do anything stupid. Don't kill anybody, all right? See you soon. Am I going to see you on Wednesday or Thursday? Ah, uh, shit, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Peter Boyer, ladies and gentlemen. Peter Boyer. Hey, Alex, how are you? I spent a summer as an intern at Marvel, and I was in Spider Man. At that time, there was a you know, some hot art Spider Man artist there. I am here. And, um, <laughs> you know, the editor of the company comes, he comes up on every page, he turns to me, he's not at all, but there he is, because he knows he'll sell more on the digital art. The money shot. And I'll argue that day, to this day, that's what we were the comics in the 80s. All those artists who just go out, spot pages and spot pages. Just like yourself, you sell the money on the regard. You're saying it's literally a confederacy of horse. I no longer do pages at all anymore. I do my figures and backgrounds on separate sheets and combine them in Photoshop. <laughs> so I completely sacrifice the existence of the page. That's the original page. You know what they look like. Apple, right, it's not only the Exactly. I just sent in two comps for uh, Archie vs. Predator 2. <laughs> um, why they call me. Archie vs. Predator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd want, I want to make sure that I heard that. That's why I can make up better than this. Yeah. Okay. I'm fascinated by the Archie phenomenon. And they'll try anything once, you know. So I think what you're talking about is a mindset about the material that really derives from fanzines and the fan culture. When I grew up, I grew up in New York City, I grew up in Brooklyn. And in those days there was no fan presence in New York City. It was all in the Midwest. It was Bill Joe White. It was Roy Thomas. These guys in places that had really hard winters. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. That's where comics were read. You didn't read comics you in California. I mean, Spicer and Benson were very strange outliers in that regard. Comics found their fandom in cold weather comments. That's because we were indoors. I mean, I had breakfast every day with, with that guy who's left. And he never read a comic book in his life. He's here because he wanted to meet Bill. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. He doesn't give a shit about my work. The influence of, of fan culture on comic books cannot be overstated. And you know, Stan opened the doors to this after the EC stuff had sort of set up the fan addicts. And Stan really played to the gallery, and the gallery believed it. The concept of a fan proprietorship these days is really disturbing to me. You know, the fact that the, that the audience thinks it has a right to affect the material as it, as it exists. But that sensibility, that those splash panel pages, comes directly from them. It's a fan-pleasing thing. And I give a shit. I think, yeah, I think it's assuming it, it's believing that art is a democracy. It's like, <laughs> yeah. um, it's like it isn't. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you about that guy. I, I was on a panel back in the days when miniseries were a new idea. And some guy got up and said he didn't like miniseries because he couldn't write it in an effective way to end it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I said, wow. And, and I think that's why I don't like video games. I want to be told the story as opposed to be part of it. I don't need to participate. And I try virtual reality once and maybe no or something. Speaking of technology, what are your thoughts on motion comics? Like, look, one of the things that we've all seen is the, like the splash page. You turn the page, you can actually create that on a, on a screen where you literally get like a jump scare. It's not me. It's every part of my skill set. Okay, I, no, no. I mean, I'm curious. I mean, really, could, because basically, digital comics are like, <laughs> and I really like the idea. Even though I'm not doing a full page, I'm still fit, I'm delivering a full page. And for me, you know, you talk about a single image. For me. The page is unto itself a single image. Oh, I totally the, agree. The, the, yeah. the panel itself is a microcosm of the page. It all comes together. And that's what it's about. The digital comics obviate that existence. I like the idea. I mean, the first time I saw an iPad, I was on the line at, uh, at LAX to JFK. There's a cat behind me reading a Romita Spider Man comic book on an iPad. I said, holy fuck, that's it. That's the next delivery system. Because I always thought it was going to be a pistol. 25 years ago, I was a speaker at the lunch. I was the entertainment speaker at the LA County Bar Association meeting on IP. And I assumed that the future of our business was an epistolary form, that we would deliver directly to our audience. The internet really wasn't an idea yet. Do you know Gene Lee's jazz letter? No. Um, Gene Lee's the guy who wrote the lyrics, the girlfriend of the Nima. He introduced Stan Getz to Pastor Gilberto and Joe Beam. He moved down the street from, from Sergio. Oh, okay. They hated each other. was great. Oh, yeah. 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 And Gene Lee's, he had a down beat for years, and he published him on the jazz letter. I said, that's the mob. That I would do eight pages, to ten pages a month, and just deliver it to my audience, being like mail it. And of course, we have the fabulous internet. But the companies have taken over the idea of that corporate digital. And I don't know. I like technology. You know, I still have my, my cows in my house. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And it's clean now because I had scrub. So I knew I'd be seen. You. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be ashamed. I like the combining of a hard copy with technology. 
I really do. You still work there, don't you? Yeah, there was a period about a year where I worked nothing but digital. Really? But yeah, I thought I wanted to get my hands dirty ever again. <laughs> and then after a year, I thought I thought I need to get my hands dirty right. again. I need to fight something, you know. Honestly, there's an antiseptic quality. It's like driving a really big car. It's like you hit something with the fender. It's like it's happening in Detroit, you know. It's like you know. It's like there's nothing intimate about it. It's like I want to like if I fuck up, I want it to be a spectacular. Fuck up. A couple of weeks back, somebody points out on Facebook, how do you do this? And I look at this as my cell phone with with it resisting ink. And Hama and I did a an entire back and forth thing of where we got it from. I thought it was Woody. And it was Vicente Alcazar, you know? Okay. Remember the Vicente? Yeah, 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 sure, absolutely, yeah. Where you take a piece of cellophane, in our case it was a pack of cigarettes. You were a smoker at one point, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been yeah. like 40 years from now. Yeah, 26 from now. Yeah. Take a cellophane off a pack of cigarettes, take a wet brush, and run it across it. And it would resist. And it was the flying clods of earth from a horse's hoofs. It was part of an explosion. It was just like a really cool technique. And I'm realizing people have forgotten this shit. Yeah. They don't know how to make an explosion with an exacto knife and ink. Rusty refused to use paint to do a star field. He would prick it out with an exacto knife. And then just to show off, he would run his hand over and him in the <laughs> and push him back. <laughs> Russ didn't get out a lot. <laughs> Russ got out plenty. Those of us who know Russ Heath, he got out a great deal. With the spatter. Oh yeah. Look, stuff. I mean, showing that to my grandson was like some other way I can fuck up my parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else, come on. Jack, what do you got? Yeah, you apprenticed with four artists. How did you know when it was, you know, when... When they fired him. Oh, when they fired him. <laughs> yeah. Did anyone else in your generation also apprentice? Rusty, Ralph Reese, Larry Hama, Alan Kupperberg, Steve Mitchell, Klaus Jansen. Klaus was Dick's background man for years. We all did, because... That was how you learn. And that aspect of our field has vanished and disappeared to its detriment. Maybe. It died in the 90s because personal computers made the, the ability to make a four color separation in your home garage. So you had the rock and roll money coming into the field, you had technical separation. Oh, that's, the the that's the thing I haven't heard you guys talk about that really intrigued me is we had that triangle in the 90s where apprenticeship went away. Because suddenly everybody had a personal computer that could create the separations that were the barrier to anybody at home doing their own four-color printing. They could do black and white printing, but they couldn't go to Ronald's because they couldn't make the separations. So the PCs, letting them do the separations at home, the rock and roll money coming in because that was the first wave of people coming through San Diego, doling out option money. So suddenly people were looking, not just doing another comic, but looking at the second paycheck of the option. And the third thing was apprenticeship went away because the field widened so much. There were so many people at it after Image came in and all that, and you had Image and Dark Horse and everybody. It got so wide. We no longer had, we no longer hired the people who had gone through apprenticeship and learned their craft. We hired the 17-year-old who would show up because since that money, the video game money came into the field, the guys who were working stopped working. They keep the same income, but they work and play video games, so their output dropped like crazy. So we had to churn through and find anybody who could make some semblance of an image to hire to put out monthly comics. See, so I that was the big turning point for me. And I never knew any of this because I was doing television for a living at the time. And I got to see comics in the 90s from the remote, and I was appalled. But that's where apprenticeship stopped, <coughs> except now they're coming back into vogue because it's sort of the spoke style of doing art, for art's sake. Well, I mean, I, just, in 81, I buttonholed Milton Kinesh and uh, Mel Sickle. They were guests of honor at the San Diego Convention. I spent an hour with them. And I asked them how to use an assistant. Well, they worked as assistants and used them. And they confirmed a lot of my suspicions. I've always had guys working in the house. Because frankly, this shit I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've done that before. I'm not going to do that anymore. It's like you're not. Nobody touches the figures much. You know? I mean, it's like I spread it around. You know, I've got an IT guy in my house, and I have a background. My background guy is like, I beat him up for years. And I showed him Taconi, and I showed him Sickles. You could see a light go on behind his head. It's unbelievable. He's an ex-gangbanger. He's tattooed from here, like his entire shirt. One of the mellowest guys I've ever known. And is incredibly good. If he's ambitious, I'm fucked. Yeah. So there you go. I learned my craft penciling for Woody and for Gray. I ghosted a lot of stuff for Gray. The difference is that I never talked about it until he was dead. That's the job. You keep your mouth shut. You don't spread it around. I did commercial work for Neil. I never did any drawing for Neil because I wasn't good enough. 
And he was embarrassed to send me to deliver work to the office because I looked like every kid did in 1969. I had hair down on my shoulders, bell bottom jeans, and a work shirt. And you know, this is a guy who woke up in the morning and wore an astro. <laughs> <laughs> he actually would show up, he would walk out of his room in an astrocan robe. No one ever thought he was gay. He was not gay. He only had his first wife, his second wife, on his first honeymoon. I've seen the pictures. How long did the first marriage I think it lasted, I think about 10 years, maybe a little longer than that. Yeah, one of his wives. Elaine, you never met the hand, did you? I've always felt incredibly sorry for her. She looked incredibly miserable. Oh, God. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, I just felt like, wow. My second wife and I, we socialized with them a great deal. We all had no palate. He ate like a child. Um, <laughs> I'm quite serious. He, he, went, he spent three weeks in Paris once and ate omelets every meal because he was afraid the host would trick him into eating rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and he ate like a child. He would butterfly it like a ribeye. Just like, why are you doing that? That's, that's, that's a terrible thing to do to me. We ended up eating at a place in Germantown, New York, called the Kleine Kinderei, which of course is long gone. Germantown is gone now. Of course, it's, it's your film now. And I invited them there. I said, you'll, you'll love it. They planned the Holocaust there. <laughs> <laughs> what? Jews can say that. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the evenings would consist of me, my then wife, who was the smartest woman I've ever known, and Gil, in spirit of discussion, and Elaine literally, there's something there. And it was I, terrible. That's kind of how I remember. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Sad. So. Yes, you! Well, look like Oscar Isaacs from a distance. I'm not. He's not Oscar Isaacs, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you both so much for doing this. You both have huge figures in my comic book and art life. Chapter number one was one of the first books that I actually really, really wanted to go by. And I dragged my mom across the valley. How old were you? Oh gosh, I think I was 14. Okay, fuck it then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I drive my mom across the valley of Golden Apple in Northridge to buy it. Bill, I have to apologize because when I bought the Daredevil graphic novel, I was really pissed off that Frank Miller didn't do something. <laughs> <laughs> You've come to your senses, I'm sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I find it, whether it's a simple line drawing or it's a spectacular painting, I find it mesmerizing that you do what you do. And it's shocking to hear that it's always a struggle for you, or that there might not be some satisfaction. It could be the simplest line or the most detailed piece. Everything you do, everything you post, is just shocking that you've done it again. I was just wondering what the thought process is, why it was happening. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, maybe I should be a little more clear. Uh, there are certain facility that comes. I mean, I've done this ever since I was a little kid. The thing is, is that there are certain things I can actually do relatively quickly. There are pieces I've done where I'm really happy with how they come out. It's at a certain point, it's almost like the very minimum <coughs> I'd expect to be, is to be professional. You know, it's like in some pieces kind of will go a little bit beyond that. At the very least, it's got to be at a certain level. Some pieces kind of transcend that. And I feel like I've hit a certain place that I'm really happy about. But what never really does get any easier is how to figure out the context in which it's going to be. It's not just about doing a pretty piece for the sake of doing a pretty piece. Again, it does have to find, you know, fall into a narrative place. For me, the ultimate calling is comics. It's like, I feel like what Howard said about doing, you know, illustration in a magazine or doing movie posters, something like that. I always loved the idea of being able to do that. But at the end of the day, what really feels like it's in my DNA is comics. It's narrative, it's telling a story. All of that other stuff is sort of at the service of that. So I might feel like I, I, I've nailed a piece and I just knock the piece out of the park visually and be happy with it. But I also feel that it has to, in some way, it's almost like there are times when I've actually felt it's more than this, than this segment of time that I'm conveying. It's like it's throwing way too much stuff. I, a lot of stuff I look back at now with the lecture or whatever, there are times I look at it and I feel like I did more than was actually really called for. It's like being a bass player. You go in and just like do a you know a guitar riff like Eddie Van Halen and just like drive everybody crazy with all the fretwork. Or you can do what's necessary. You can do the job. It's that restraint. You know, it's like listening to singers who can't hit the same high notes that they could in terms of the acrobatics. They compensate for it in other ways. So for me, one of the things that I'm, I'm more intrigued by now is developing a backlog of technique and things where I can kind of do all the stuff, but at the same time, it's almost like, well, just because I can, it's like, 
how do I work smarter, not harder? It's that kind of a thing. I don't know if you go through any of that. My work is more spade and straight. I've stepped away from doing more eccentric mostly because I feel like I'm best served by keeping it simple. That said, I'm working on the third volume of Times Square right now, which is a very difficult process for me because I'm going back and doing things that I haven't done in four years. And having to remember to overwrite, to create panels that have a nervous energy that aren't necessarily as deliberately literal as I've been doing, I have to keep reminding myself to do this right all the time. And I succeed in some cases and fail in others. The other thing is that the originals were done in blue line, that incredibly crude process. Mm -hmm. right. And now, of course, we've got this absolutely gorgeous color effect. I mean, the things we do with your color is staggering. My colorist understands explicitly and implicitly sometimes, you know, I don't want to make the same mistakes, but I want to achieve the same effects. And, it, and Brusenak is going to be lettering. Brusenak is the best of what he does in a raging pain in the ass at the same time. When he chooses to, he can be very literal. And then when you want to be literal, he gets a little, uh, you know, in looking at the pages I was working on today, they're very methodical and very, very direct, but I know once color is applied, and once we start introducing the super depth, because there will be, even in places with large areas of blank space, will be filled with text, right. because it's a very noisy book. So working today in this way is so much of what I was talking about earlier, about planning my mission. I have to really anticipate how fucking weird it's going to be on Thursday when I'm doing this on Monday. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's all done in piecemeal. It's all put together slowly. And I, I haven't painted in 20 years. I have no desire to go back to it again. But I really, I really like the freedom I've discovered in, in realizing that I'm never going to have to learn to ink a comic book. I don't know how to ink it. I have no idea how to, what that means. I make drawings. The fact that Klaus has become a penciler mm -hmm. saddens me. And the work is, that stuff that you guys did together, when I saw those pencils, I was floored. They were competitive and stuff that he was doing. You know, they, oh, they were just yeah, really it was just amazing stuff. Um, yeah. I can't make that transition. I sit there and I methodically massage, you know, I'll take a little bit of tape and clean it up. Because I'm sloppy. You know? Well, I share that with you. I'm totally a, a slob. But for me also with the business is the artifice of it. Because I don't look at it as penciling and inking. I think of it as drawing with ink. Right. It's making, a, making pictures. Yeah, that's all it is, you know. To me that's a little bit like the old, you know poor program of, of trying to put stuff on an assembly line. It's like, okay, you're going to be putting in the, the windshield. You're going to be doing the tires. You know, it's like, no, no, we're making a car here. So let's just put the whole thing together in that way. I'm physically incapable of doing that. No spit set there at all. And it wasn't until I get comfortable with that reality that I was okay with it. Marker, ink brush, pencil, just make a mess. Right. Thank God for contemporary production. Well, that's one of the things, when I do the memorial pieces, I found that... Now you're doing those by hand. Bro. No, those are all by hand. I mean, occasionally I'll do a black and white, and maybe I'll scan it in, maybe add a color or whatever. Right, but, but, but you're but, still getting dirty. Right, yeah, yeah, they're all about that because I don't have one... There's a clock ticking. It's like I give myself two hours top to do a piece or something happens. And then, in case they come back? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but the idea of actually saying I don't have to worry about any kind of preconceived idea because if I do a piece like a Joni Mitchell's birthday or so whatever, it's like this piece has to be black and white for some reason, or this piece is going to be in color. And so when I dive into it, I have no preconceptions, no, it's got to look a certain way. It's all about process. I'm not thinking about the result. The only thing I care about is whether it looks like the person or not, or even more or less feels like the person as opposed to looks like the person. For me, the, the Roth piece would kill me. To me, that's what he was to me, but thank you. Yeah. I know that comics is your is your art, but I wonder if either or both of you have any points in your career really had like a personal artwork that you show the gallery. I've, I've actually had gallery shows yeah. for paintings and stuff like that, but I also feel to me the idea of actually having comic work in galleries. There was actually a museum in Madrid that had some of my political comics brought to life stuff mm -hmm. in the same museum, literally right around the corner from like Picasso and Botticelli. Wow. And I was like, to me, I think comics can do anything. So the idea of actually doing a landscape or whatever, I like that idea, but to me, it's not the same as doing the medium. This is where my blood boils, you know, the most. I'm a comics manager. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my wife was never read a comic book in her life and has no idea what I do for a living. Uh, she has a vague notion of it, and I mean vague. She will often say, write a novel, write a musical. Nah, 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 I'm good. I love comics. 
I love the idea of conference so much more than the reality of conference, but I love conference nonetheless. I sit down at my desk, I'm up at five o'clock in the morning every day because I'm dead good. And I go out and do a bunch of shit, I have breakfast with the old people like them. I like having breakfast with people with me because it makes me feel boyish. <laughs> and, um, and I'm at my desk by my nine o'clock. Once I settle down, I'm really digging what I'm doing. I really am. I like the idea of solving the problem that doesn't hurt me every step of the way. And making accidents work is the way to go. I'm 68 years old, and since I'm Jewish, I'm not really white, but I'm considered an old white man by an enormous part of the comic book community at large. And uh, fuck them. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. I plan to retire by the sound of my head hitting my desk and I'm not followed by a yelp. As long as my skill set holds up, I'm going to be doing that. Do you actually still feel really. It's kind of almost disconcerting to hear you say that you feel that you've been marginalized to the extent. Oh, absolutely. That you know, I guess I don't I experience am you that way. I'm marginalized. Because I, first of all, I, I disappeared from comics in the 90s. And there's an entire generation that's come of age at that time. There are people who, I mean, look, in the space of a week, I was referred to by some nitwit on the left as a demon in a human skin suit. <laughs> and then the same week as a neutered butler of the social justice warrior. Ouch. Poetry on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> now, Piss off both sides. If these fuckers would actually make a fucking living and stop spending so much time hating me, one of the things that progressive left seems to have problems with is the Nazi right. Me too. But it would be interesting if while they were slinging shit at each other, somebody might actually do a good book. But no, what they're doing is this anodyne horseshit. You know? I'd like to see a really good crypto fascist comic book. I'd like to see someone come along and do for comic books what Norman Spinrad did for science fiction with the Iron Dream. The Lord of the Swastika. The first classical performance I ever heard in my life in person. I was dating the woman who became the mother of my child. It was a brand new chair. It was conducted by Everett von Karajan. It was your favorite conductor. I found this halfway through the show. My date was a beautiful red-headed Dutch girl. In no real context, in the beginning, I was like, oh my God, you know, I guess. But it's very tough being loathed and despised by both sides of the aisle. Because neither of them read my stuff. They just presume. They grant themselves a the narcissistic power to identify through their projection what these things mean. The ambiguity is no context for these people. To a great extent, the first cover of the divided states of hysteria, which is a picture of a woman wearing a niqab made of an American flag, presumptions were made by what I meant, but I meant nothing. It was simply a provocative image with no specific intent to provoke, just an image that was provocative. It didn't say one thing or the other, but because these people grant themselves these second powers, they draw conclusions. Now, the people who should hate me on the right, because I am, after all, a reasonably leftist sort of cat. But the marginally, where I am out here in the margins is because, unlike my contemporaries, I didn't identify and build a career by doing a mainstream superhero character to generate an audience who would stay with me and follow me. Also, I make my taste and interest abundantly clear and it doesn't endear me to a lot of people read comic books. I don't care. One of the reasons I came to California was because I recognized, as I said, I was never going to make a lot of money in comic books. And I was going to get this fucking album, and I know what Social Security does for you. I went and worked in television. I never worked on a show I watch. I've made enough of a living to own real estate and get a pension, which gives me enormous freedom. And that freedom pays for my ability to do whatever I damn well please. I don't care about superhero comic books, so I don't do superhero comic books. I do genre material, because I like genre material. I like westerns. I like fucking stories. Uh, I like crime. And I like doing all that kind of stuff. And I like drawing and I like writing it. And the audience doesn't read the material. The audience simply imposes its own conclusions on the material. And I expect this from the Nazis. I'm disappointed by the left. They embarrassed me because I vote their way. I said to someone recently who demanded that I denounce the people at Comicsgate, having no idea what the Comicsgate was at the time because I don't really care about other people. I'm kind of so obsessed, as I said. And I went and investigated what, what they were so upset about. I think it was three guys who were also my Facebook. And I read it, I wrote back and I said, you should know that when Hitler came to power, he wasn't elected by a majority. And that it wasn't until the German people found that their lives were improved by the Nazis that they became perfectly willing and complicit in the course. So those of you out there who are asking to denounce are gonna be denouncing your friends sooner or later if this autocracy continues. So get ready, look over your shoulder, look your left, look your right. Some of the people who are your friends now are gonna fuck you later. 
So I ended up unfriending the people they suggested I defriend, but also the schmuck who asked me to denounce them in the first place. So fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> we live in an ideological world that objects to ideas, that is afraid of ideas, that rejects iconoclasts of a sense of a victim culture. And fuck them. You know, if, if you really want to be victimized, you can do it on your own. Leave me alone. Leave me out of this. So I get up in the morning, I do what I do, and I hope someone likes it. I can't depend on an audience that... Bill knows this. I think I can speak for both of us. We both have an enormous number of people in the comedy business who have utter contempt for their audience and yet take their praise as just. You can't do that. I believe that's impossible. I remain completely neutral to my audience's intentions. If someone tells me how much they love my work, I'm also reminded always that they also like shit that I hold them to contempt. <laughs> Right? Especially on the left, one of the things that I've seen a lot of, it reminds me a lot of the battle between vegans and vegetarians. <laughs> About purity, when the carnivores, when the carnivores are just going completely off the rail. It's like, no, we're more pure than you are. It just drives me crazy. Just, I don't know what my point was, but that. I like it. <laughs> The worst television show I ever watched was called Earth Final Conflict. It was like a bad television show and a novel about bad television. And the showrunner was a guy who never had any experience as a writer. It was like he was rewriting everybody. He was, he was a disbarred lawyer. He was the first vegan I ever knew. And it's poisoned my relationship with the entire culture. I have to remind myself whenever I meet someone who's a vegan, they're not Paul. They are not Paul. They are people. You know, you wouldn't run them over again, you know, that kind of, but yeah, I think, I think it's balanced. You know, yeah. you know, we are becoming micro tribes. We are slowly but surely slithering ourselves smaller and smaller into, into tinier and tinier ideologies. I grew up, I'm a member of a popular confront family. My parents were classic reds. The earliest known photograph of my uncle Julie was getting punched in the face by the cop. We grew up that way. My credentials as a leftist are pretty solid. I'm pretty comfortable with this. And unlike a lot of people who think you grow more conservative as you get older, this is not true for me. Um, I'm not that guy. But I find myself charged by people who, whose identity is defined by a sense of hurt that just staggers me. Are any of you aware of like, the past couple of years, there was this, I think about five or six years ago, there was this whole spate, NPR was reporting this, but all these sex parties going on among teenagers, 13-year-old kids, you know, with, with oral sex as currency. What happened? At, why not? They're not fucking and the incels can't get laid. What happened? When did that happen? And someone pointed out today, how can a culture raised on South Park be so offended by everything? <laughs> I grew up with a desperate need to argue. I mean, I grew up in a Talmudic family, and I learned to argue from the Jews outside the shul. And we argued about the Torah and the Yankees. <laughs> it was serious. I mean, this was some serious shit, you know? Every one of them smoked Chesterfields, you know? And, and they taught me how to behave in public. And, you know, and I'm going to walk in the bar, you know? But I'm astonished at the delicacy of this culture, the Eloy and Warlock nature of the future. The whole thing about going to college, you know, it's like, the whole concept of safe spaces, it does drive me absolutely out of my Yeah, trigger warnings, exactly, all of that. My assistant, as I said, is high spectrum autistic. And I explained to him that extent of his autism, he's a fucking idiot. And that is the, the way it goes. I cannot accept the fact that there's a quote from Eldridge Cleaver in that book of meditation that reaches, too much agreement spoils the chat. <laughs> and I tend to agree, you know. I don't have friends that I agree with on everything. I'm like that old fucker. He's just a whiny Lutheran. I should have known. I should have known. But he's also known in that context as America's favorite Juther. You know, these are men that disagree with me on almost everything I believe. And being disagreed with keeps you young and green. It gives you the impetus to move forward and tell you, no, fuck you, this is why. It's not about using sarcasm on cats, you know? It's actually having a conversation, you know? I live in a small town, and I like living in a small town, because people have no idea what they do for a living. When they find out, it's like, like peanuts? And it's like, <laughs> Just like peanuts, that's what it's about, you know? So... That's why you, you and Schultz were never in the same That's right, you know? It's <laughs> and me, baby, you know? So, I think we have time for one more, and then, then we're going to slip off in the night and get curled. Okay. No? You're not? You've completed your mission? Okay. Have you had a good time? I certainly have. I hope I've had a fabulous time.
You guys. Can we thank Michael before we go anywhere? Okay, three quick things before everybody goes. First of all, the Art Center Library brought some books by these two guys. Anybody who wants to look through them, just don't steal them. You're stealing from the library? Don't do that. Second thing is two more events this semester. Next week, Parking Superheroes. <laughs> if you're interested in Silver Age Captain America with Jim Steranko, that's coming next Monday. But he's not going to be here. No, no, no. no, no, no. He's not Alan not Schumer is going to be here to present in Jim's place. And two weeks from then, if you're interested in the EC comics of the 50s that were censored and destroyed by Bertham and Company, there's a theatrical group that's going to be putting on a performance of banned EC comics. So, <laughs> wow, that's awesome.